three, two, one. Hello everybody, welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. I am Chris Schmidt and this is a live stream where we talk about Cinema 4D and try and answer questions from the chat live. I don't know what's coming and we just try and figure it out as we go. So we'll be answering everything in Cinema 4D, but the questions might not come from Cinema 4D. Uh, feel free to ask questions that are involving a link. Otherwise, type something in bold if it's a, like a typed out question and then we can also try to address that. I'll keep an eye on the chat. We've already got a bunch of links popping up today. The chat's going crazy, which is amazing. Uh, which I super appreciate. Thanks, everybody, for coming and hanging out. We already said some hellos earlier, so let's just dive right on in. Uh, man, uh, okay, I'm going to share the screen, and we will start clicking links directly. So let's see. Uh, Tom got in with the very first one. Thoughts on this one? But let me just read through because we got a bunch of different things coming in. Uh, Jess, feel free to type the question in. I'll try and keep an eye out for it, but I'm going to click this link from Tom. And wait, even open on the correct window. All right, so what do we got? This is from StrackNL, or maybe it's StrackNL. Either way, it sounds cool. Oh, Strack. So let's see what we got here. Oh, that's neat. Oh, you know what's funny? Um... This is actually an excellent question, although the, uh, oh, these connections, no, not all those connections make sense. Okay. Um, so first of all, they are saying that, well, it's rendered in cycles, but it's made in Cinema 4D. So this is actually an excellent question. Uh, just to give a little bit of um, context. So um, this, this is a free live stream. It's every Wednesday during the season. Uh, which is typically what uh, somewhere between 26 and 36 episodes depending on the year um, but i've been through patreon running a bonus stream and on the bonus stream i try and dive a lot deeper on something that or just trying to learn something more and last week we got a question about um these ribbons and during the stream we couldn't get it working very well so i spent another two hours during that second live stream just trying to figure it out just figuring out the different details and limitations. And I actually recorded an entire video and sent it over to Maxon about some notes of things that didn't seem to work intuitively anyway. But in any case, uh, we learned a bunch of things about the technique. And now, because we have this question and it's actually using very similar techniques, we can actually spend a little bit of time and try and uh, use what I learned last week and apply it here. So I'm actually very excited about that. So with that in mind, we will switch the camera over here and begin to try and figure this out. So once again, very cool. Uh, very cool piece here from Strack. I am mostly interested in the technical aspect of this, but let's see what we can do. So, of course, we're in R21. We're going to start out from scratch, although we'll be using a lot of the same techniques that we did last time. Um, so, um, let's see. We're going to be doing different scales on these. So, what's the best way to do it? <laughs> I guess we'll have to just make, a, we'll have to be very specific on the end sides. Or is it, let me think, I'm sorry. There's a bunch of different things to think about here for subdivisions. So what am I thinking? Um, if we make this a uniform subdivision, let's say it's subdivided. Now, if I crank this up, I'll crank that up. Okay, cool. It does get really low poly. So that's good. So we've got a circle shape, and usually I would use an end side, but that gives us very specific point counts. But what I want to do is have this be more based on, now, a specific point count. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, apparent, oh, Nico is saying that, uh, Strack had mentioned that he did this with XP dynamics, man, we gotta just, maybe, uh, maybe that's something to tackle tomorrow in the bonus stream is just playing with some of the XP dynamic stuff. Cause it's just not something I played with, even though I know it's really powerful. So we just gotta start learning it, but let's do this with vanilla cinema because I think we can. Okay. The reason I am using a circle spline is because we can set a maximum length based on a distance and not a set number of counts. So we'll do that here. And I'm not sure what number we want. So let's jump to 10. It's probably gonna be too much. Yeah. Um, and we actually typically 10 has been a good number for us. So about every 10 units here, it should be creating a point. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just visualize this a little bit better because I think this will be handy. So uh, creating a sphere, putting into a cloner, putting the cloner onto object mode and putting that onto the circle. And I'm going to tell it I want to clone onto the vertexes. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Well, it's not cloning onto the vertexes of the final object. It's cloning them onto 
the original points. We actually might get be able to get around that if I put this circle into a connect object. If I hold down Alt, it will automatically put it inside. And now if I tell that to go onto the connect object instead, uh, it's not viewing it as a spline. So we have to tell this tell Cinema that this is a spline. I always found this a little bit clunky. But if we put this into a spline mask, holding on Alt again, then that is now being treated as a spline. The weird part there is that the connect object is still going to, I'm sorry, the cloner is still looking at the connect. We didn't change the connect. We changed it to parent, but now the cloner is viewing this child as a spline. Very strange, but hey, that's what it is. Now, I'm going to set the radius of the sphere to 10. And we can now see that based on these subdivisions that these are overlapping each other. So we might actually want a radius of five. There we go. At the radius of five, I would think that these would all be but perfectly touching each other. It's pretty close there, and subdivide doesn't exactly go in the units. There's angles and whatnot to it. But that's kind of what we're visualizing here. So you can see with a radius of five that this is what we get. Now, if we want to turn this, and that's just a reference, that's fine. But if we want to make this dynamic, I'm going to leave it at zero, zero, zero. Let's subtract this floor to minus five. I think that will work. And then add soft body dynamics, simulation, soft body. And if we hit play, then that should just fall to the ground. We won't see much. This is you know, visually is getting blocked. In fact, just for fun, I'm going to rewind all the way, scoot it to the side just so we can see it. So if I hit play, you should see it fall. Actually, <laughs> we have to make the floor dynamic. That would, that'll help. So you can see it falls to the ground. Boop. It actually does fall a little bit. Or maybe it's even hopping because the floor might be intersecting. Um, so we'll have to find out. So when it comes to this, we need to give it a margin. Now, I've been trying to do some extra research lately on the difference between size increment and margin. And I got to tell you, it still does not make sense to me, even as I go deeper into it. But OK, now you can see I've given it a margin of five, which essentially means it's creating these little spherical radiuses around every one of the points that's being generated. And now if I play, you'll see it doesn't look like it falls. And that's because this floor is exactly five units below that. If We set the floor to, let's say, minus 15. It should now fall 10 units. So we now got that radius. But you can see that if those little if these little spheres, if our if our margin here was bigger than this five, it's going to be too big for the shape, and thus it will cause it to explode. So just for fun, we'll jump that up to 11, and you should see that it's going to explode, and you can see that the different lengths, you can imagine these spheres suddenly being twice their radius. They're going to be intersecting a bunch, so it has to explode outward so it's no longer intersecting. So that is the basic idea. Now we can get rid of the cloner and the copy spline. And rewind to zero, and we will set this back to a margin of five, which is quite reasonable, and we'll even zero it out on Z. Okay, cool. So you can see that's the idea behind what we're doing. And now we could sweep this with a radius of five if we weren't so inclined. All right, now we don't want to emulate the pattern exactly here, but he's got a bunch of overlapping sphere. I mean, I kind of wish we'd start with a cube now because... Um, well, let's just uh, let's just see what we can get here. We'll just have some fun. So we've got a circle. It's got that radius. If I were to make a, I'm gonna make a duplicate of this circle, and then make a cloner, and I'm gonna make a duplicate of this circle into the cloner. Set the cloner to object mode. The object will be the second circle spline that I created. T for scale on the radius, which means I can just increase that a little bit, and I'm gonna make a bunch of little circles around the outside. So. I was just making this. I guess I, I didn't need to clone into an object. I could have just on a radial. Um, so I can increase the count until these are all very close to each other. But I actually don't want to get too close because they need to be the radius away from each other. And now just for clarity, I could make another duplicate of this. And as I was just saying, I could do a radial instead. And I didn't need to make that extra clone. So yeah, something like that. I think we'll do something like this as our base shape. Um, now we can visually ignore this one because that was um, that's just creating a clone. And why don't we trap everything inside of a second circle here? So that's the idea. If we hit play right now, I think everything should work properly. Hit play, and oh, did that? Oh, ooh, interesting. When I, I I'm gonna grab these two circles, and when I scaled them down, it also scaled the maximum length down. So we need to reset that back to ten. And I hope that the, yeah, it doesn't scale the tag, but it did scale that property. But okay, this shouldn't explode anymore. So now we hit play. Now it doesn't explode. Nothing even happens. It just sits on the ground. Excellent. All working perfectly well. Now, um, 
Something I would like to do is try and group all these and see if we can control it all with one dynamics tag. I don't, this is an experiment. I don't know if this will work. So if we put these all in a null, and I move one of the tags up and I delete the other ones, the defaults in Sim 40 r 21 say that the tag, the, it should inherit. It will apply the tag to the children. So let's see if this can, well, I guess visually we won't see anything. So uh, I'll just move the floor down a little bit. So now we should see it fall. Yeah, they all fall. So it seems like they are still dynamic. Uh, we're still getting that uh, refresh at zero isn't working properly. So we'll just continue to deal with that. Minus five. All right. Now, okay, now what's cool is that we're controlling this via a single tag. So it's easy. We don't have to make changes to a bunch of different tags. So we don't want any bounce. We don't want any friction and even collision noise. I don't know if that's going to help. This just adds a little bit of variation to the way that the dynamics are bouncing. So we'll get rid of all those. Now, what the plan is, is we want to keyframe our rest length for it to start growing, or the alternative would be we start shrinking something here. So uh, I think growing here would be probably a good idea. Um, but what I'd love to do is trap these in some sort of circular shape. So um, this is kind of a little bit of a spoiler for the upcoming tutorial, but something I've been experimenting with a lot is if we were to just trap all these, let's say we trap them inside of a sphere. Uh, we can make the sphere invisible and then make it so they can trap, be trapped inside. They can escape very easily. Um, I'm almost inclined, yeah, let's see if we can, let's intentionally do it the bad way so that when it breaks, we can see how to fix it. So um, uh, under render tags, we will add a display tag. Set it to lines and we can see exactly the cage that it's in. I don't want to take too long to calculate, but a couple extra segments. Excellent. Scoot it up just so it's not right on that edge. And that's all good. So hitting play, I mean, nothing should change. It'll just sit there. Now, if we keyframe the rest length, and we do have to keyframe it, we could, here, let's intentionally break it again. Let's save it before we intentionally break it. So episode six, scene files. Um, spline cells. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Uh, if you don't know, if you are supporting on Patreon, then you can get access to all of these scene files after the episode. All right, so I'm going to jump this up to 200. So it's double the current size. And I, I want to be careful because these are it's going to be bad. As I, I'm going to go one frame forward. I'm not sure what happened. One more frame forward. And we're going to see that these are going to start exploding really quickly. And several things. First of all, we didn't make this very dynamic, so ignore that. But you can see that they're exploding very quickly. It's not very controlled. And let's, we'll put into a more con controlled form here in a moment. So I'm going to steal the dynamics tag from the floor. We're, um, it is, you know, you see dynamic is off. So it's just a collider body. Collision is going to be set to a static mesh. And that means it can be trapped inside. So that's fine. And one more thing I just know for a fact that we're going to want to do is if we're working on kind of a two dimensional plane here. So the these points cannot get through a floor, you know, if you shoot two dynamic shapes at each other that they can start intersecting, something cannot ex it go through the floor. It's like mathematically impossible because it knows that it cannot. But a floor is infinite, nothing can go below, below negative y. So we did this last week, if I take this floor, spin it around 180 degrees, and then move it up to positive five units. We are now trapping, I can move this above because it is above in the viewport. Uh, these are now, tra it's like a, there's a, the splines are like a sandwich in between these two floor pieces of bread. One's pointing down, the other's pointing up. They're perfectly trapped in those 10 units. So that means they can't escape outward and above. Now our splines, I'm gonna move this up. Our splines are still set to jump to a rest length of 200. So I'm gonna hit save again, just in case and hit play. And now we can see they're expanding. Actually, it did, a, it did a pretty good job. That's not bad. I thought that would be worse. Um, what I like to do is have a little more control over it, which is to keyframe it over the course of a couple of frames. So setting the rest length, it didn't explode here. And I don't know if I can push it far enough. I can just tell you that I know for a fact that I have run into, okay, I pushed it too far there, but you can see immediately it freaked out a little bit. Um, setting it to the default of 100, keyframing it and moving forward even like five frames and getting to your next scale, let's say 150. 
and then hitting play, we can transition between those two scales and it's a lot more reasonable. So, um, you know, that worked nicely there. There's nothing super crazy. It looks like 150 is about the scale where it will fill up most of the volume here. And yeah, there we go. We get the splines. Now, nothing's escaping out of the, 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 our cage of a sphere yet, but I'm going to leave it broken. Well, it's not broken. It hasn't broken yet, but if it breaks, then we'll talk about the fix. Um, so this is a very simple version of it, but let's see if we can get this working. And I don't know if we will be able to. Um, now, something we learned during my bonus stream is that we need to bake this out and bake it out to a Lembic. Now, R20 and R21 makes this pretty trivial, but there's a couple details we learned. First of all, let's get a little bit of motion in here. I want some, some extra wiggling going on. So uh, under simulate forces, we will create the new field force. And with the field force, we can start giving this under the object tab, not the fall off. I do that all the time. Under object, we'll feed a random field. Now, typically the random field is actually facing, it's going to randomly push these in all directions, which is bad, but we're perfectly trapped on the floor. So it's going to completely ignore going up and down. So we can actually keep this rig more simple. Now, uh, scaling up this, it's going to start putting some coherence in the noise overall. I want there to be a lot more strength. 55 is pretty good. And an animation speed of some, not too crazy. Let's say 25%. Let's just hit play and see what we get. Probably need some more frames as well. 333. Three, three. Uh, save it, hit play, and let's see what we start getting. So this grew, and now hopefully we'll see that we'll get a little bit of motion out of this. It's not moving too much, so there's definitely motion, but not as much as I want. Um, I mean, keep in mind it's playing back at a third the speed, but I'm going to make it three times as strong on the wind on the strength here. So hopefully we can see these start doing a little bit of a transition. I don't know if the scale is too large, but we can definitely see there's a little bit of motion overall. Um, now we could inflate these a little bit more. You see there is a little bit of space between them. So I think that would probably be a good idea. Or we have to put a few more spheres. Once again, we have to rewind, go forward a frame and backward a frame in order to catch it. Um, we, uh, I'm going to attempt to just create an extra copy and increase the radius. So there's an extra sphere in there. We'll grab the outer one, also create an extra one, maybe even an extra two. And if I increase the outer, which one is this referencing? This one, if I increase the radius, they shouldn't be intersecting. Um, so there, we just filled up the space a little bit more, not too much, but it shouldn't change too much. It's gonna expand, there'll be less space in between. And yeah, that's okay, that's working nicely. There should be no friction because the floors have no friction. And at this point, I'm just inclined to keep on cranking up our field force to be a stronger and stronger until we start seeing some distinct motion here. Now it's not animating very fast, so I'll crank that up a little more. Okay, a little more animation speed seems to do a decent amount. And we can see these start wiggling and they're scaled up so much that, um, you know, they're filling up the space quite nicely. Um, we could scale them up more, but you know, that's working all right. I do still wish there was a little more motion. Is this I'm going to crank up the speed to be three times faster that. Yeah, they seem to be blobbing around. Okay, there's definitely still some air in there. Um, but you don't want to, you don't want to, I don't want to push the limits too hard on that. Um, just, I guess we can just grab the second keyframe right here, grab the dynamics tag, and I will scale this to uh, 160. Not that much more, another 10%, but that should go a long way to filling up that extra space. Um, okay, good enough for me. Uh, visually going to hide the field force so it's not taking up space. And our sphere here is doing a great job, but I'm going to hide that because it's, this is all trapped in here just fine. All right, so these are... You know, it's funny, this outside is actually taking on the shape of that sphere because it doesn't have that many polygon segments, so something to keep in mind. Um, so this is, I've, I've played with this technique a lot, so this, which is why I, I seem to know what I'm talking about here because I've actually done a lot of tinkering with this kind of stuff. It's really fun. Um, all right, but now is where things might get a little bit more challenging because we need to essentially combine all these into a single spline, and that is easier said than done. If we try and take this and put it into a connect right now and extrude it, it is not going to work. So how do we actually make this start working? Well, we need to, first of all, bake it. So I'm going to select the dynamics tag and let's say bake all. And I hope, you know, the scene's almost 300 frames. Ah, we shouldn't, 
uh, if we're doing these tests, I'm just going to drop it back down to 100. It's not going to play for that long of animation, but at the end, we could make it longer. So bake all just at 111 frames. Excellent. All right. So if we have play, I mean, this is, you know, we should be able to scrub now. It's pretty good. Uh, definitely something I've noticed is the uh, dynamics. The final frame is always a little bit glitchy, but, you know, just cut off the last frame. Um, I've also noticed where things aren't correct on frame one, but these are all things we can deal with, especially because, and I'm just saying this is a fact because we did a lot of testing last week. What we'll now do is bake this to Alembic. Although we, did we last time we made it, well, let's just see what happens. I'm going to bake to Alembic. And there we go. Oh, we got a null. And it doesn't have the children. That's not what we were getting last time. These are baked. Well, let's just do, do some tinkering. I'm pretty sure this won't work, but let's try putting them all into a connect. So they've all been turned into one object. And I'm going to create an extrude. We'll put this into the extrude. And immediately, I think we see that it's not. Oh, okay, it's, it is. Okay, well, right now, oh yeah, that, that was always a problem. It's returning geometry right now, but if I hit play, it doesn't play. So the, this does not work if we hit play. So I'm going to attempt to grab this connect and bake it as a limic. Let's see what that does. So it's claiming it's a spline. We put this into the, actually, let's see if it plays. Hit play. And yeah, here's the alembic. It baked that out as a spline, and it is now an alembic file. If I take that and put it into the extrude, let's see if that plays. Yes, it does. Okay, so, I mean, almost immediately, you can see that we are getting the overall effect from that animation. So let's change, uh, let me make material on here so we can see it a little bit better. And we will make it a nice teal color. So, uh, yeah, there we go. You can see that we are getting something similar to shape. We, we're inverting from one spot to the other, but I, I'm glad we're doing that because I don't want to make something too similar. Um, the big point here being is to play around and try and make it your own and, and change the overall effect of of everything that's going to be happening here. Something that would be kind of fun would be to clone a couple of spheres inside here, and those will actually be bouncing around and trapped in between the floor as well. I might actually go and do that. But you can see that these are all getting extruded very nicely. And yeah, that, that works well. Now I would like to try and push this a little bit and see if we can get them to smooth out more, but I'm not sure if the technique will work. It begins with creating a tracer object and I'm gonna feed the tracer, yeah, this connect object. I'm gonna visually hide everything. And if we take the tracer and say, I want to connect all elements. Yeah, it doesn't, and unfortunately it doesn't work because every one of these splines is connecting to the next one. So there's actually a tracer version of it. If I play, it's going to be tracing the entire thing. You see how it's doing a great job of tracing the entire thing. But the sad part is, is that the tracer yeah, is interconnecting them. So it can't, the tracer can't view this per segment. It can only do it um, as a whole on all of them. So um, yeah, that's too bad, but it's just the, it's just the limitation of it. Unless we can close it. Nope, closing doesn't work there. That would have been a way to smooth it out. But in any case, we've now got a very nice version of this. It's simple to subdivide this if we wanted to. And the extrusion, of course, we've got the nice new caps inside. I'm going to turn off start cap and just keep the end cap with this upper one. We've got the new beautiful bevels inside of our... Um, or 21, so I could actually increase this all the way or just something quite high, but let's try pushing it all the way and see, you know, so we end up with this shape, which should automatically be pretty cool. Hit play, that's all working quite nicely. If we were to take this shape, I don't know if those get welded together, they may or may not, but if we create a subdivision surface and throw that inside of there, it will smooth those out. I doubt they got connected, so just as an experiment to find out, put that into a connect, and now they do get welded, Oh, it doesn't, well, there you can see one point right there is welding or unwelding. But it actually does seem like when these caps run into each other, they do get welded. Well, that's actually good to know and, and surprising. I'm glad that they do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we could pull this radius back and not let it go too far. Uh, and you can see we get a little bit of subdivision weirdness here. It's probably because um, these caps are N-gons. So if we were inclined, we could change it to something like Delaunay. Um, Delaunay is, of course, well, we can 
tell Delaney to try and be quad. So wherever it can be a quad, it will be. And that should subdivide nicer. So you, know, you see you don't get those stretches that we were. So now we get this rounded out. We get these nice little pinchy shapes, pinched shapes all over the place. Uh, we should get pretty good playback because the spline isn't dynamic anymore. It's just playing based on the final shape. And you can see how much control we have over, you know, just changing the the overall style of this. We can round it out just a little bit. You get these nice sharp ones, round it out a lot, get these more blob shapes. The entire thing could be fed into a volume builder. And of course, they, you know, make completely different geometry based off of that. Um, but there we go. By baking it to Alembic. Oh, and let me throw this out there as well. Remember, we just we were doing the we baked all the splines. Um, you do have to do this cache. We were definitely running into some some weirdness when if you don't bake it, the Alembic. If if you don't cache the dynamics, then when the Alembic plays through, you'd think that that would take you know, that would do the dynamics as well. But we found that they would give inconsistent results. So you want to bake that and then bake to Alembic. And that seemed to be the workflow that was uh, very smooth. Uh, and these all combine very nicely. I'm, I'm quite happy with the ability to put that into a connect and then bake out the connect to Alembic. Um, it's just the extrude doesn't like the connect directly. So I, I'm, always, I'm always a little bit uh, sad when we have to make, when we have to bake to Alembic, but it, you know, R21 makes it so easy to do. Um, so slightly less parametric, but very easy to go back at any point to our original one and create whatever shape that we like. Um, let's see, any follow-up questions on this little thing while we're still here? Um, just to throw it out, well, I mean, just for fun, I'm going to, uh, let's delete that, Alembic, turn this on, turn that off, clear the cache, and just for fun, I'm going to put some cells inside of these. So if I were to take a second circle, make it a child, T for scale and scale that down. Now we have a second circle on the inside of that, and now if I were to bake that again, then those should also be hollow. So just the way I'm layering up these different rings is creating various different shapes. Um, Eric is saying from earlier, I could uncheck merge all in the Alembic export. Um, that very well could be, but we're still ending up with a good result right now. So I'm not even sure where you would do that, but bake as Alembic. And maybe it's in the checkbox. But now that gets created, and maybe what are you referring to? I don't see any merge or anything. But in any case, um, we've now pulled that out. We can feed this in again, and I can see those are hollow rings. They look a little bit like calamari. And if we play, then now those will be hollow rings, just like the outer ones. And they should have the same thickness because the thickness ultimately is the radius or the margin of five. So those uh, end up being some cool little blobs as well. Uh, I wouldn't eat them, but that's pretty cool. I like it. Um, let's see. I don't see any specific questions about oh, this one coming in. Got a thumbs up. Thanks, Spatten. Um, but yeah, let's give this one a incremental save. Where's the incremental save? I've only just started doing it. Control, Alt, Shift. There we go. Alt. And let's jump back in and do some questions. Um, nobody's, I think I cut you off guard, so nobody's posted new ones. I can scroll up to where we had a whole bunch of them. And let's see what we got. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. I want to see, because uh, I like typed questions. Uh, and uh, Herrerasaurus, Jess, is asking about putting fish scales on a weird shape but want it as a mesh and not displacement. Ooh, that gets real tricky. Um, fish scales are just, in, like scales in general are, are very difficult. And if you look at the way they flow on something, they always, when they turn different corners, when they're on the different curves, when two different angles meet each other, very unique and strange things happen where they will be different scale, or yeah, the scales will be different scales. Um, so a lot of it turns into, <sighs> you want to prevent intersection, but we, there's a lot of trouble with it. Let's just see, let's just make a quick testing piece of geometry. So I want to keep every, well, actually, no, I'm not trying to keep it clean. So we'll extrude there, D for extrude here. That'll give us a corner there. Grab these, I for inner extrude, D for extrude, D for extrude, and 
Let's make one tiny one here. We'll do that and do this. Okay, so we've got some very strange geometry here. Um, let's do one extra shape there, get this little curve. So uh, let's assume that this is just some weird piece of geometry that's supposed to get scales on it. Now, what I'm thinking is let's use the exact polygons as a way of scaling something very specifically. So I'm gonna make a duplicate of that, make this editable. Actually, we gotta be careful. Um, well, that's fine, this is enough scales. Um, so of course we get some interesting things like we get this weird point on here. Everything's four po everything is four polygon, or everything is four sided, they're quads, but we get these little pinchy axes here. Um, and well, let's see what we can do. Um, uh, my thought, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, the basic scale could be a good job for the very rarely used. Um... What? Anyway, it's so rarely used, I didn't realize they removed it from here. I bet it's still in cinema, but they. Uh, Bezi. Nope. Yeah, it's this uh, Bezier NURBS, but they removed it from the NURBS menu. Did they move it? I don't know where they might have moved it to, but here's the Bezier NURBS. Um, so I don't, you know, you don't use it too often. It's, it's just kind of like a cube that's uh, been put into a subdivision surface. But I like using this to make leaves and scales and things like that because um, you get all these extra subdivisions, but you get these points that enable you to rearrange it. So I can do something like that. And you can see we get this nice smooth curve overall, and all I have to do is change two points. Now, this is actually generating quite a few points, so we're gonna pull this way back, five by five, but uh, it's under the procedural objects menu. I mean, isn't that this? Am I blind? Is it in here? I don't see it. Oh, well, it's not important. It, it, it's here, and you can just use the uh, command manager or the commander shift C to find it. Uh, okay, so we got this. Oh, and the other thing I like doing about this is the overall shape was 400, but now I can take all of these points, hit, uh, move them up 200 units, and now the axis is right, if I go off the point node, but the object node, you see I have my axis is right here at zero. So it's just a, a handy little handy little thing. Uh, oh, and I forgot the other main reason I grabbed it like this is because we can grab these middle points and I can pull it out and now we get this nice curve to it. So a little bit more like a scale. All right, excellent. Now it's gonna be way too big for our piece of geometry, obviously. Let's give it a unique color. By the way, I don't really think that this is gonna work, but let's just see how far we can push it. Let's make purple fish scales. Okay, I'm gonna scale it down to approximately the size of one of these polygons, even though they are all intentionally different. Drop inside the cloner, clone onto the object. The object is this thing. I want to clone onto not not every edge, but let's try polygon center. So really ugly in the beginning. I, you know, actually I'm starting to think that we might need to put it on the edge, but I don't know if that's going to work. Um, because if we do it like this, that there is no orientation, but I believe if we put it on the edge, we are going to be getting an orientation. We're just getting four times the amount that we want because it's creating one for every single edge everywhere. So my next thought turns into, let's say that we don't want to clone every single edge. I want to clone every fourth edge. Um, okay, that was just an idea, but it didn't work. It didn't work because even though we're cloning onto these edges and three out of the four are um, just nulls, these, and, and what's nice is we do get this orientation comes along for the ride. The problem is, is that Um, uh, because I think because of those different, uh, poles, because of like this right here, it's changed, like these are sharing an edge and that's sharing an edge, but it's changing the way it, so if this was just on a plane, that would work. It's not just on a plane. It's on this crazy shape. Now we don't have a, there's no flow direction here. So that's going to be one of our challenges is how does it know what direction to face? And, and this doesn't, you know, this doesn't even begin what I consider to be the actual problem, which is um, 
stopping them from intersecting and to properly scale them, which is what I was thinking was our real trick. Um, Paul, that's an interesting idea. Procedural. Some, everybody's saying that they saw it here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, <laughs> the Bezier is down here. They used to be in the nerves object, and now it's in the primitive objects. Um, good to know. I was wondering why it was turned blue instead of green. Um, okay, anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, Paul's suggesting that maybe we use hair and we brush it. That's a pretty good idea. Um, it's a pretty good idea. It would tell you, you have to brush it, but you know what? Like, I don't think you're going to get the scales for free. And that's a pretty good method. What I was, what I was about to lean on would be like projecting like a shrink wrapping a, a more coherent shape, like a spear onto an object like this, but that wouldn't work everywhere. So, you know what? Like I say, I'm kind of liking that idea of using hairs to do it. And then it's not polygon dependent anymore. Although, well, I mean, we're not gonna get the scale. I don't know, the scale for the scales. It's gonna be a tricky one, but you know what? It's a very interesting question. It's one I would like the answer to. So I got the, raw mesh selected i'm going to add a actually do we want, no, I, yeah adding a hair object makes sense so what this is currently doing is creating a single hair or in this case what will be a scale on every single point and i think that's fine that's going to give us a nice distribution now one of the big tricks is that we're not getting unique scale from these, there's no, there's nothing about this mesh that's going to enable us to automatically scale these. But well, let's just keep moving on. Let's just see. Let's just see if there's something to pursue here. Um, under editor, no, not editor. Let's go to generate. I don't want to render hairs, but what I would like to do is make an instance. What is it? An instance of? It is an instance of our Bezier. And with any luck, um, should that happen right away? Um, editor, generate. Shouldn't we? Oh, uh, it might be actually doing it already. I'm going to open up my hairs by clicking, double clicking the hair material, and let's try giving it some thickness. Try 11 by 11. Oh, we should definitely be seeing something. Okay, I did something wrong here. Maybe that needs to be made editable. I was pointing up on Y, so that should be correct. Sweep instance. I mean, instance is what we got. I don't think frame updates a thing. Um, it's only doing guides. Someone is saying, um, yeah, it's based on guides. We could say that the hairs are generated as guides. I'm gonna make this editable. I'm still not there. Make it editable. Drag in that one just to be sure. Deform, bend, hierarchy first. Keep aspect, keep texture. Okay, I'm doing something silly here and I'm not sure what it is. I just got to find the right checkbox I'm missing. Display guidelines. Hair lines. Hair polygons. Generate. Uh, no, I don't want to do any of these because I want my geometry. I thought if I turned on my geometry, it had nothing to do with this. And this is not our shape. That is not the scale. That is not the scale. La, 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 la. I just want to do some tests. If I say I want to generate a square, the thickness, yeah, the thickness here should be the only thing that matters. And we got a pretty, it is definitely got some thickness on it. Hmm. What am I missing? This should just be generating geometry. It's a very straightforward thing. I've literally done this dozens of times. 
Uh, Tobias, that might be a good idea, but first we need to generate some geometry. Generate. Triangle. That should be sweeping. Uh, Dean, we already made the thickness 11. I mean, this isn't that big of a model, so we don't need to, yeah, if, like, we should be very, very clearly seeing something already here. What am I doing wrong? I'm going I'm, I'm, I am making some sort of silly mistake here. I'm going to make a sphere, make it edible, simulate, add hair, immediately we'll add a thickness of 22, 22. All right, excellent. Now, that's all good. Generate triangle boom see it's there what are we what's different like it, it should be as simple as that um all right well i just don't trust what that's doing at all so do it again from scratch simulate we are i have a object selected simulate uh, hair add hair before we do anything else we will generate a square okay it is generating that give it some thickness i'll say 11 it should get really huge that's fine and now i'm going to say okay nice that is what i wanted don't render the hairs i do want this to be an instance and the instance is going to be the bezier object okay it's not accepting that let's put in the made editable one it does take that one, not surprising. And now you can see that we get our piece of geometry actually being generated. Now under hairs, I'm gonna say, I don't wanna see individual hairs. I want these to be as guides. So there's literally, literally as many as there are guides. No idea, I don't know what we just did differently on this time and then the previous time, but there you go. Now, the nice thing is how we can control, we can control the scale of these just via the thickness. So because we're already controlling the shape completely via the Bezier, these should be the same number. So 55, 55 should make nice big fat scales. So those are the super duper duper basics. So we got scales. Now, the fun thing maybe is not something we do very often. We can move into the hair tools. I'll pull this off and we have all of our brush tools. So grab a brush and we should be able to just start painting these and follow the curvature of our object. Now, this is going to fall on the person making it to, first of all, build the overall flow of these, but it's also going to be on them for making sure they don't intersect. There's nothing here to prevent intersection. And you can immediately see as we comb, like, you know, a lot of this is pretty nice, um, but very quickly, you know, you're going to see there's uh, there are a lot of intersections and we have to be very precise on a lot of these. Uh, so there's, you know, it's this isn't like a instant foolproof, instantly working method. But as far as quickly creating something, it's not it's not horrible. Um, if you ever go too far with these, you see, like even here, I can I can just go nuts and like straighten them all out and follow that curvature. You can always go back to the straighten and Actually, it's going to apply to everything. I don't know if it has to be on everything, but yeah, it's got everything. I could select some of them. I can just pull this a little bit and have them, you know, go a little bit more straightened up. All right. So now let's just say, okay, we did that and it, you know, it's, it's neat, but you know, I wouldn't call these amazing scales. And also the orientation seems pretty arbitrary. You see that these are following the curve properly, but over here, um, I guess some of them are, that one's backwards, but some of these are correct. I don't trust that. Overall, it's not a, it's not an amazing method. So, and then, so there's that. And now I do want to see if there's anything we do about scale. Um, Eric, who, I think it was Eric. I'm not sure who said it, but somebody was saying something about, I'm scrolling to see if I can see it, but it's too far back. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, no, Tobias. Using a vertex map potentially to drive the scale in the hair material. I just don't know if that's going to work, but I like the idea of giving it a test. So uh, we'll do the very basic version. We'll create, grab our mesh and select a vertex weight, set it all to zero. 
If I double click that, I can just paint a vertex map. And if I, there we go, just a basic one to do a test. So vertex map, painted it a little bit inside of our hair material, um, inside thickness. I will attempt to add a vertex map. And in there, we'll drag said vertex map. And doesn't seem to have any effect, which is, unfortunately, I thought there was a really good chance that would happen. You can see they all get sad. Um, yeah, the vertex map is not going to be fed through on the shader, so straight up limitation there. I don't think the guides have a growth and like they have this overall length, but that doesn't have anything to do. There's no place to feed a vertex map inside of it. Uh, I think literally not any place to put any of them. So like, as far as automatically doing it, we could have done a process to try and make the vertex map be brighter the smaller that they are, that could have been something to do. Now, having said that, you know, we do have the option, you know, using those same, I shouldn't have closed them, but using those same hair tools, there's a cut tool and I can go through and cut and it's actually going to make these scales shorter as I cut them. Now that is on an individual scale basis, but you could scale them down. At that, at this point, like we are spending a lot of time trying to wrangle these when really what we want is a parametric option so all this manual all this manual stuff is you know essentially going against the principle that we're trying to do which is you know to what degree can we automate this um I, like i said I, I didn't have a great feeling on it but we've been tackling some tricky questions uh this season and we've been getting good answers so i thought there's a chance we'd think of something clever and feeling like we don't really have any option here as far as doing something very parametrically or even just a cleaner process nothing is immediately jumping to mind um the uh copying the surface open the new one paste in the shape it, um, like what I would love to do is, you know, like explode all the polygons and then select like a certain edge, but we need some sort of programmatic way to choose which edge should be selected. Um, like just as a, for instance of what I'm trying to do here, if I were to select all the polygons, hit U shift D, which will pop open the disconnect menu. I'm going to say, don't preserve groups. We've now exploded every single polygon. So, um, Oh, I guess we could have done it this way as well. I can hit I for inner extrude and just inner extrude a little bit. UI to invert, delete. Now you can see we have a bunch of individual polygons. So it's like, okay, well, these are kind of on the, these are the flow of the mesh. Now, if we could, you know, we could throw these all into a subdivision surface. And if we had a way of selecting like the fourth edge and the fourth edge actually meant something, like some sort of rule, we could use various techniques in cinema for instance this is always one well, here's one i don't use too often but we could select it's a real it's a pain to select these going to select everything behind it but if you select certain edges we can use oh man i never remember where this is because i use it so rarely i literally use, lose this um mesh Mm, tools. Where is the uh, subdivision surface like weight tag? I don't remember what it's called. Certainly not showing up in any obvious place here. Um, oh, maybe here it is. Weight subdivision surface underneath mesh add. If I click and drag, nope, not quite working there. It did create the tag. Maybe the tag needs to exist first. No. Set. Set, no. Points, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I, I, I held down shift, converted my edges to points, and then if I click in the viewport and drag, you can see that, boom, it's going to sharpen up those two edges that I had selected. So, okay, that's something. And if we could make something that was a little more parametric, then we could be like, okay, that that's, these bottom edges are flat. And then select, if, let's just say we only had these two polygons selected. 
you know, if we had a way of automatically selecting, let's say, the bottommost edge on every one of those polygons, then we could do that and then hit UI in, well, no, not UI, uh, UI and invert the selection and then do some sort of parametric, push these outward and then potentially do some sort of subdivision. This turns into an entire modeling process, MF, to do a cut down the middle. Now we could select those and potentially grab just the top middle point. So you can see how I'm doing a very manual process here, but that these would flow over the mesh quite nicely. And even at a certain point, you can be okay, cool, that is what they are, and now scale all of them. But that's on an individual polygon basis. We just don't have any way of... We just don't have any way of modeling, or of, of doing that process parametrically through the entire mesh. Every step of the way through everything I just did was a very manual process. So undoing here. You know, just imagine having to go through and select every bottom edge of every one of these polygons. That'd be absurd. Um, now, I'm not saying there wouldn't be some way to do this with code, which would be, you know, like select every polygon, select the bottom most point, select the second most bottom point. Cool, that is the bottom of the polygon. Like, there's ways of doing that. Um, but given what we have now, there's nothing I can think of. I mean, Paul, you're, uh, Paul's throwing out some good suggestions, but like, I don't like a cloner plus an aim effector plus a push apart um, and some dynamics. Like, I, I don't know, at that point, it's just getting completely insane. Um, the, um, although you're, 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 you're saying dynamics there, it does, it's funny because it does make me think about of one completely absurd process let me let me think um if we did take this overall shape and then we clone this will be weird i'm gonna go grab our original scale and we'll go back here paste it so we've got a scale so if we were to take a cloner and feed this in and clone onto an object and on the object I'll just say every single point. Then we get all of this. And uh, now I guess the orientation is going to be super duper tricky. Because if you want these to face properly, I'm not sure what axis we want. There we go. That's the one. Negative 90 degrees. So now they're all pushed perfectly outward. The, um, the rotation isn't working too well. But those are all facing outward. Now, if we were to do the aim, the target effector, rather, now you see they're all facing it. So this doesn't work everywhere, but assuming you want everything facing the same direction. I, by the way, I think having done that, this, my original 90 degrees doesn't do anything. You can see that these are all just rotating to whatever angle. So the target is sort of uh, overriding everything. There's different orientations that we could select here. Um, I'm actually quite certain that none of them are going to be correct because it's going to be mostly about the object rotating correctly. So the easy fix for this would be to also create a plane effector afterward. And now this is rotating after the targeting. So now what would I want that to do? I don't even know what I wanted to do, to tell you the truth. The point being is if I were to rotate these all like this, you can see that this top part has a very nice orientation overall. And then if I were to take all of those and rotate them on, say, this axis, now they're not overlapping too too badly. Now they're actually kind of tiling like a scale from a, a certain point of view. So then, and this uh, once again, we're not doing anything dealing with scaling, although you can... If we, I didn't think about it, if I change this to polygon center instead, we can enable scaling. And now they will scale based on the scale of the polygon. So that actually gives us a, that goes a long way. Okay, so now you can see we got all the scaling and they're all kind of, uh, kind of an orientation, not for the entire model, but for a good portion of it. So what my thought then was, is we can't just rotate them automatically. But if we did an absurd thing, which would be to put a, some sort of hinge on them and make them dynamic. That's the insane part here. So I'm going to temporarily turn that off. So 
So we've got our clone. Make a, what are we going for? Dynamic connector. And we can say how we want this to be able to rotate. So let's say, let's keep it as basic as possible. I'm going to say it can just rotate on that orientation. Make it a child of that object. This connector wants to connect from there to the surface of the overall object. If we make a bunch of clones, and now you can see those all been connected. Now these connectors, I don't think, are going to work. I'm also very worried about hitting play. Oh, they're not dynamic, so nothing's going to happen right now. Let's turn this into a collider body. Oh, even that, I don't even know collider body makes any sense. Static mesh is fine. And then these will be a rigid body. I don't think any of this makes any, is going to make any sense because currently these are going to ignore collisions on that internal structure, although I, I can think of a way around that as well. Uh, save a file. When we're about to do something really dumb, you save. <sighs> okay, let's try hitting frame forward. I'm pretty sure the individual clones are going to work, but they might. Well, actually, they do seem to be connecting even within the cloner. So, you know, okay, that's nice. So, uh, and they seem to be running okay. So you can see if I play, they're all kind of tilting and doing their own thing. So they're, they're weird, but they're working. So now I'm going to turn off gravity. Command or Control D. Dynamics. General. No gravity. And then create a simulation forces wind. And this wind, I want to blow towards the model. And it's always too weak in the beginning, so I'm going to set the 55. It's been playing okay, so I'm going to hit play. And I can see, okay, in general, they all tried to tilt backward, but they're not. They're going to immediately be stopped by, I guess, the other. Why are they stopping? Like, okay, I guess one, like the ones that have enough room fall over, and then they're blocking the next one from being able to fall. Is that sort of what's happening? Hmm. Is that sort of what's happening? I'm not sure. Now I'm going to change our connector to. It's probably a bad idea, but I'm going to change it to a ball and socket, maybe even a rag doll. No, ball and socket. Ball and socket can rotate anywhere. So ball and socket can rotate any direction. So if I have play, these should all a lot more freely be able to wiggle amongst each other. And yeah, you can see them start. Yeah, some are going to rotate down and push out of the way, but they did they did successfully tilt backward a little bit more. Not as much as we want, but there's a lot of overlap happening right now. This is this is weird and fun, so I, I am willing to continue for a little bit as long as we're getting something interesting going. I can crank up the wind up a little bit. Um, on the actual dynamics, we got all this friction. No friction, no bounce. Uh, and then I'm going to add a lot, 99.99% linear and angular damping to strain the energy back out again. Now we hit play, and now they should be going anywhere the wind tells them to, but no more than that. So they're trying to settle into the most comfortable position they can, given the current condition. Um, so, you know, it, it, okay, so I will say it's not working everywhere, but look right here. These are the best scales I've ever gotten right there. Look at these awesome dynamically placed scales that's that's pretty cool and crazy already um so like i said we were only kind of looking at it from one point of view and that worked but the wind that makes sense because well it makes sense in some spots like back here that wouldn't make sense because the wind's not going to blow in that direction <gasps> although maybe using some field forces we could get like right now the wind's just blowing in one direction and if we were to use field forces, we might be able to make it get a particular orientation around the model a little bit better. I'm not sure about that, but um, but let's just deal with like some of the problems we're getting here in the front. Um, so you can see these are falling backward. They're all very large, so that's potentially a problem. We'd want, that. that's just the sheer scale of them, I feel like is trouble. Now, this is, yeah, here's how much the scaling is going to affect it. So let's just not, you know, let's not even do that. There is no scaling on here. So they're all the same size. Hit play. Let's see. They're, they're okay. They're, well, I mean, with them being smaller, not surprisingly, they're able to kind of blow in the correct direction a better. And now overall, this surface is working a lot better. Now this curvature there 
is not horrible. Okay, you know what? Like, this is, we're getting somewhere. This is weird. Um, weird and interesting. Um, let me think. How do we get them to point in the proper direction? Because I feel like it's, it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, can you generate... We could clone onto the... No, that wouldn't give us a rotation. We could generate a single polygon. I'm trying to think of there's a way of using hairs to generate, like, an orientation for us, because it does a good job of that. And we could generate a single polygon on each one. That would be neat. All right, let's um, let's slow down here a little bit. Let's see, let's see what we're getting. Turn off the target effector. Okay, so now we're just back to regular old cloning. And let's go back to negative ninety. So now they're all just spun outward. We are cloning onto the polygon center, but that doesn't give you much of a direction. Edges would give a direction, but every other one, and not literally every other one, but almost every other one would be doing uh, a different orientation. We don't want that. Points, I don't think, do any better of a job. Vertex, yeah, the, the orientation is just nonsensical here. You can see that the rotations are all over the place. Um, so then, but given that as a premise, if we turn on the target, I just don't use target effector that often, but I wonder if there is an orientation that we can get that would be handy. Um, and then the direction it's facing gets really, really specific as well. The target object. Um, there's also... Those are directional for the flow. Uh, Paul, what are you referencing? If you hit T, you get the scale for what? I'm not sure uh, what you're referencing, so be more specific. Um, oh, <laughs> you're joking. I thought, hey, if you're going to be all excited, I'm going to take you at your word. Um, so, okay, these are all pointing to the left. So that has to do with the orientation. Man, I wish I had a better feel for the axis here because this is using pitch, but if we turn off pitch, then now everything is... How does the targeting work then? Yeah, now it's just a rotational angle. You reverse the heading, which will invert them. We don't want to do that. Repel... I mean, there's so many combinations here, and there's not things I have too much experience with. Kind of what I want them to, these to do is just aim outward, and then look at next node. Fe oh, they can aim in the field direction. Ooh. There's a lot of options. I forgot these get field directions now, and field directions can get crazy field direction and so that's going to be looking into this fall off and if we feed in this model as a surface then that will generate um, I don't actually want it to this shouldn't affect the clones it should only affect the direction and yeah so this is now affecting direction based on the surface of the model although everything seems to have moved very strangely and I don't know why that would happen if it's just a target effector why would the direction change the position. Turn off repel. Oh, repel was still on. That was doing something. All right. Um, so yeah, this is it's referenced on the surface. There's so many variables here. We would just be clicking and clicking. Oh look, we're getting a we're getting a little uh, SIGGRAPH reunion in here. Hi everybody. Uh, normals. Use the normals. The problem is that we need to control two axes. That's the part that's throwing me off here.
create a spline. I mean, I kind of want only on a particular orientation as well. There's so many, like I, the problem is that right now there's too many options. There's too many places we might be able to travel with this because uh, like the next thought that pops in my head would be us creating a series of loops like this. So if I were to be like, uh, create a series of loops, and you can see we're gonna be missing certain places so it doesn't work perfectly. But if we were to do this type of slicing and then shift C edge to spline, then now I've got a spline and I could clone onto the spline we turn that on, then now oh, I want to turn off the targeting because that's just getting weird. Um, this spline, I think, will give a lot better orientation overall. If we set that to a certain number of steps, set that to 25, we can get, start getting very even distribution of these. And I guess it wants a rail spline. That would be pretty easy in this kind of basic setting up of the model. Just scoot that forward and feed it that as a rail spline. So there we go. Now everything has the exact same orientation. So this is kind of the orientation I'm going for. It is not rotated correctly, but is the orientation I'm going for. Get rid of that 90 degrees and let's find the proper one. Looks like negative 90 combined with 90. And then we could spin it. I'm not sure which axis it is to spin, but you, the point being is you, all, you see how the curvature of these is all facing forward, although <laughs> half of them are facing inward. So. That's just the thing that happens with splines where it's the direction is alternating. I don't know what triggers it to alternate one way or the other. Um, so even that's being a little bit of a pain, but yeah, we could twist them as well. I'm just, none of these axes is doing a good job twisting. This also happens sometimes. Um, maybe it's being overridden by the, um, that might be getting overridden by the, uh, orienting to the spline. So if we were to take this plane effector, yeah, there, if I take the plane effector and increase H, it does rotate. So it, it, this isn't working on all of them, but you see this single row, you see how they're all oriented in the correct or direction. And I can put that little bit of twist in them so they're not intersecting each other. So if I could get that to happen everywhere, that's what I'm trying to get. And then once we had that sort of a rig, um, then we could blow the wind on it. And I think even now it's still set up for it. If I hit play, is it, uh, maybe all these ones on the ground are going to break it. Maybe they're intersecting each other. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, just as proof of concept, I'm going to delete all except for, I think this one, U W U I delete all the splines except for that. I must have more than one. I'm going to delete that. Delete that there. Now you see I have a single spline. So the cloner is taking a second to catch up again. And honestly, even this one without a rail spline, it's still doing the correct orientation. So, you know, that's fine. A single spline there. If I hit, why is the, oh, I turned the wind off. I'll turn the wind back on again. Okay. And then you see this will blow them all backwards and they are intersecting each other, but they're not colliding with this mesh because this is telling them not to collide with that mesh. So if I turn that off, they will collide with it. And now you can see that we get a series of scales all lined up there. And if we were able to, we're not, but if we were able to, I'm going to select that spline, click, don't do this too often. Can we clone? Maybe we can copy and paste. Copy and paste? Yeah, nope. I thought in R21, when you copy and pasted points, copy, paste, no, paste in the viewport. No, it's, it's putting them as a new object. Maybe if I hold down control. Okay, if I hold down control, it's working. And I can see I can make a copy and a copy and a copy. So um, still, this isn't exactly what we want to be doing. But you see, if I hit play, now we're going to start getting pretty nice scales lined up. This is turning into, well, well, let me take a step back. It's a little bit, oh, Effectatron, fake it. I don't want to fake it. We're trying to make it real. It's no fun to make it fake. You can see that by doing a little bit of this process, um, we, they're going to tie, they're going to layer up very nicely. So essentially this is what we're going for. I'm just trying to think of better ways of automating this where we can kind of be on any mesh direction. Um, now we did just select a series of loops and a bunch of them were the wrong direction. 
but this blind does such a good job of giving it the correct direction. Now, I I don't want to count out the target effector. The target effector very well might be able to do something like this, but it's a very particular combination. That's the kind of thing I wouldn't want to do in this stream. Um, that would be more in the bonus stream to do that type of thing. Uh, because there's a lot of a lot of places we can push this. Well, and the hope goes to using field forces. If we could get a flow of particles traveling the surface, then the wind could blow in every orientation and not just blow straight backwards, but also like blow upward here where it needs to and it blow downward as it covers goes down the back. There'd be a lot of combinations we could get. I gotta say I am I am quite pleased with how clean the um, how clean the, what am I even trying to say? I am impressed at, oh, how fast the dynamics are running. Sorry, completely lost my train of thought there. This happens when we're getting something that's almost working. Um, now these are already colliding, so I expect a bunch of them to freak out. Yeah, top ones are better. But yeah, so we need this to be on the mesh very, very, very cleanly and only in one orientation. So doing this type of cut makes sense. Uh, Zach, putting a helix around the model has potential. I'm also thinking... <sighs> yeah, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to copy the original model, go into a new file. And we could potentially also just do a series of cuts. Let's, I mean, let's continue to be like, okay, we want to travel backward along the overall surface. Uh, I mean, I know we got a weird shape here, but we're intentionally trying to make it difficult on ourselves. So um, if we go to our side view and let's go to polygons and we go to knife and I say, I want to do a, I think it's a plane cut. So K J we get a plane cut and currently it's in free mode. I want it to be on world mode and the what axis are we at? tech okay we can see right here how it's cutting that's not what i want let's try the zy so there you can see we're getting a cut across it so that's cool but here's where it gets interesting we can say i want a number of cuts and i can see i get 10 of them so if i were to say let's say um not that many let's do 50 cuts with a spacing of 20. So now if I move my mouse over in the proper spot, you're gonna see that we're gonna get a whole bunch of little cuts. So I'm gonna now say I want to select those cuts. So now when I go to cut the object, let's do right there. Now if we go to edge mode, those are all selected. So boom, we've got a bunch of cuts perfectly cutting through the entire object. Now we say shift C, type in the word edge and find edge the spline. So now we've got a spline and copy that and then hit undo because we didn't need all those knife cuts on the actual object. So now we can paste the spline back in again. And now we've got a bunch of evenly spaced cuts around there. Now I do not trust for a split second, I'm gonna copy that spline. I do not trust for a split second that this spline is actually gonna return everything in the correct direction. So let's just see what it does. Uh, cloner, feed that as the spline. And I imagine half are gonna be pointed inward. Um, well, it looks like only two of them are going the wrong direction. You can see these are going the wrong direction. Now, I don't know if this will work, but I'm going to make a, just to show you, copy, new file, paste. If we select point, select all, right click and say create outline, and I start growing this, these are all going to push out, except, oh, yeah, yeah, this won't work. Well, I mean, this won't work because you can see that we have a handful of splines that are traveling inward instead of outward. So the fix here is to manually find the ones that are not working, which is not many. And uh, go figure why some of them go one direction, some go the other. But we can now pretty easily tell via our clone here that everything up front is working well. But then here, that's a bad one. And there's a bad one. So I selected one point from each and hit UW, which selects all the current, selects all the points that are connected to the current ones. And if I right click and say point order reverse, then that flips those around. Well, it flipped one of them around. I select like this one, UW. And I can't figure out what's wrong with that one. Let's reverse the order again, reverse sequence. Yeah, that one's still being weird. What's wrong with you little fella? Hide the surface. Um, point 
Sweet order, even yeah. I mean, you just you just see the a very very occasional weirdness that we get. Select one of those points. I'm gonna say set first point. Okay, I set a different point at the first point. It was okay with that. So very very strange. So in any case, we now have an entire series of scales. Now let's just let's intentionally poke holes in our process here. You can see because we had this big horizontal section um, here, there was traveling vertically rather that that did not get enough scales, but the rest of it has done a pretty dang good job. The orientation is pretty good. Uh, all the dynamics and everything are still set up. I'm just gonna hit save again and let's hit play. A lot, okay, we have a lot more of them, but now we can see that the wind is blowing them backward. And a lot of this, a lot of it has done a pretty dang good job. You can see that these all tilted backward beautifully. Those are the best, those are now the best scales that I've ever made. So that's nice. Some of these aren't quite sure what to do with themselves. In fact, oh, look at this. Look, there's one, this one set is rotated wrong. I didn't even notice it, but yeah, we've got one more rogue spline where the scales are backwards. So I'm going to do the same trick. I'm going to select a single one of the points and try and set that as the first point. It did set it as the first point. Um, also, let's try closing the spline. Ooh, don't close the spline. Um, that suddenly freaked everything out. Um, so let's try it. Why, why are these faced the other direction? Now that might, hmm. Why would that happen? Actually, looking around, there are several, several that are facing backwards. So that this goes back to the rail spline idea. So that's actually not bad. If we make a copy of the spline, move it forward, and then in the cloner, feed in the second one, which was the second one? Yeah, that one. Let's rename it rail. Feed that in as the rail. Then, okay, well, it... It did something to these, but all those bad ones have flipped around, which is now making me think that those flipped. So we just have as clean of a process as we could. We did perfect knife cuts on the entire mesh and still we're getting these things flipping around. So, I mean, while I don't think this is an, it's, it's not taking a long time to fix what we're seeing. I'm trying to get these two. I want this to be very, we don't, a rail spline does not have to be very offset. So I'm going to try and move them very close to each other so I can select both. And now let's see what the fix will be. If I just like that point. Yeah, so I got those two points. If I say set first point, that didn't change anything. If I sit UW, select all or select connected and reverse the sequence, that did fix it. So the rail spline combined with that fixed it. So not insane. I'm going to select, select. Uh, so far, I've been lucky. I haven't selected points on the opposite side. If I were to rotate my mouse in the axis was in the center, then we would know something went wrong. So that seems okay. UW select, point order, reverse sequence. Uh, that seemed to have fixed all of them except for one very picky one. UW, point order, reverse sequence. Okay, it did work that time. Okay, now there's no backwards ones. So uh, a, a little bit of fixing time was required, but that wasn't too bad. Now we hit play, let these all blow backwards. With those fixed, it, the overall flow is working a lot better. Um, so yeah, not bad there. Uh, the scale of them is gonna have a, a very big impact. Let's save it. So we have a lot of control over the scale. I mean, we could even use effectors. Uh, that's what's cool is this is super live. So we can see that along the top here, when I hit play, the resolution, essentially there aren't enough scales and they're all running into each other. So we want those to be a lot smaller. And I think we could probably just create an effector and shrink them. So with the cloner selected, I'm gonna create a plane effector. Pull this up. Um, actually, I guess I need to pull it up. I'm gonna say scale in a uniform way, in an absolute way, negative. Now we're gonna see all of them shrink. So that is how small they would get. Then I can create a fall off. And in this case, I will just create a capsule fall off, not one I use very often. Move it over here. X plus for some reason, instead of uh, Z plus, which I should have been building at. T for scale. And now you can just see, uh, the point being is these are all scaling over here. So those become smaller scales. And now, hopefully, I, well, I want to see the reason for doing this. 
is I want to see if that continues to work with the dynamics. And yeah, it totally does. So if we gave this even a little bit more of a fall off, unhide that, we give this a full fall off. Now we can see a bit of a better transition, pull it down just so everything can transition into that shape a little bit better. And then hit play. And that transitions better in there. And I mean, if we scaled it properly, then I think that those would start working pretty well. Um, and look at that, like overall, not too bad. We're getting something somewhere. Um, let's see, I know the chat's going a little off the rails here, but we're still, uh, we're still tinkering. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to get distracted now. There's a lot of different variables that we're playing with here. I wanted to give these a little bit of extra freedom to be able to tilt over. So these are these connectors are just ball and socket. But keep in mind, we could have gone with a regular hinge. And now they can only, I think, tilt backward. Well, forward and backward. So they're not rotating at all. And you know what? That's doing a pretty good job. You can see up here, they fight a little bit more. So by turning that into a ball and socket, they can kind of rotate any direction. So if I play, you can suddenly see these all start scooting around each other a little bit more. And I feel like that little bit of extra freedom goes a long way. Um, now, what I'm trying to think... This is, this is pretty good, I gotta say. Like, these are some... These are some pretty great looking scales. I mean, look, these are these are clones. So if we were to uh, remove this material, we can trivia. It's you know we can, of course, just add a um, random effector. Did I have it selected? Yeah, cloner. Random effector don't affect the position, but instead affect the uh, color. We can get random colorized scales uh, and have complete control over the uh, way that these are all going to be mapped and colored. So like, you know, these are, these are actually dynamic. Um, and then, oh man, it would get super duper, duper, duper dangerous, but I've even got it in my head where if we did a spring connection, we'd actually make these soft bodies so they could actually bend over each other a little bit. And that bending could get the curvature going a lot better. Um, And right now I'm just trying to, well, I mean, we could try and get a field flow that flows over the surface correctly, pushing everything in the right direction. Because what I really like is if these weren't, right now these are trying to pull backwards, but it goes to, do you create, if we could just get the surface to do it would be the best, but you know, like in a pinch, we could just make a second wind and that wind would have a fall off to right around here and that would blow these inward and that would go a long way. Um, but this is uh, this is pretty incredible, actually. I really like this. I, I, I guess I say there's like four different times while working on this one. Let's see, Control Alt Shift. That worked. Um, there's like four different times I was like, ah, we should stop. I don't think we're gonna get anywhere. Um, but we pawed through and we're getting something that's pretty good, pretty good. So what I would love to do is do a. Where where is what what I'd like to do right now is find kind of a problem area. Yeah, like this top part. Okay, this top part's a good spot where all these should be lying flat. But just be by the way they're overlapping each other, you can see that they're fighting a little bit. I would like to do. I just saved this as a new version. I would like to do a more a much more limited test here and try and make them soft bodies, which is insane. But if we make it low enough poly, I think. We can control it all right. So here's a thought. I'm going to select just those. That's plenty. Select connected. Oh, that's weird. You, oh, that's gross selection. Uh, select connected. And then UI, delete. Delete all these. So now we've just got a couple of them. So we're going to get plenty of... Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, I missed a rail spline. I was like, something, something's weird here. Okay, there. I accidentally missed a rail spline. UW, UI, boom. Okay, now we got that more limited. Let's get rid of that old one. We don't need it. Clone. Okay, those are all still facing the correct orientation. It's great. Now, the important part, let's go into just our model here. I'm going to scoot off to the side. So here's our single scale. Now, it's pretty low poly, but it's not as low as it could be. 
and we can always subdivision the surface later. So I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to hit UL for loop selection. Turn on stop at boundary edges and grab that. Grab that. <sighs> How low do we go? I'm going to get even get rid of those as well. Very, very low poly. Right click and melt or dissolve. Dissolve. Yeah, dissolve was the correct option there. We've got some extra points hanging out up here. I mean, yeah, I'm going to get rid of these two. Delete. There. Okay. Four polygons of four sides. Very, very low poly. Now we have a connector, but a connector, this connector won't do anything when it comes to a soft body. So instead, what we need is a spring. It's gonna get this is this is a bad idea, but let's just find out. I'm gonna create a spring. The spring becomes a child. Reset PSR. So there it is. I'm gonna even scoot it right there, right to where the point is. And what is this connecting? Well, it's connecting the Bezier. What is it connecting? The center of mass? No, it's moving the specific polygon point. And the specific point is I, I, there we go. Two. It's point number two. You can see where it became very, very small. Now, currently the rest length is 100. It should be, I'm going to hit set rest length. You see it's almost at zero because it's not quite on top of it. I don't need it to be directly on top. So there we go. We got a spring. It's right on top. Now, that's fine. Um, now, this turns into a soft body. We're currently draining lots of energy out. I've actually found out that that's bad for soft bodies, so we're going to go really easy on that. Although drag and lift will, that'll do a great job. Yeah, we're going to add some drag and lift to both sides. So that's going to drain the energy out from them moving too fast. And then we're going to go soft body and the structure, very important. I don't want the stretch. But the shear, well, the shear, I want some shear. I what, Here, I don't want any damping. No damping, no damping. Uh, flexion, I want it to be able to bend. Shear, I want it to be able to shear, but not that much. I'm going to set it to 10. And that's about it. So now, I don't know if springs work in a non-editable cloner, but we're going to find out. So control, alt, shift again. Turn on the cloner. And <laughs> they're soft. This is a lot of soft bodies. Um, so I'm scared to hit play. So I'm going to go frame forward. Oh, that's, no. Oh, oh, no, it's not bad. So I can hit play. It's running fine. Okay. So you can see they're getting away from the spring quite a bit. So let's see if we can chill that out. Well, I have a very strong wind right now. So let's chill the wind out a little bit. The spring, they're getting away from the spring. So we can, it's got, I'm going to, Crank the sniff this to 11. And that should stop it from getting... Okay, that stopped it from getting away too much. And now you can see that they're all blowing over. Now, these are soft bodies all connected in the spring. And the... Um, oh, man, I can't believe this is working. And it's working this fast, too. I mean, I know it's super low polygon, but that's, uh, that's pretty good. So those are all bending. Now, it's incredibly low polygon. And that means that there's not much bend. So a little bit of... Flexion will actually go a long way. So I'm going to drop that to one, and that should enable them to bend up more. Even that seems like quite a bit. Uh, I'm even going to go easier on the structural so they can stretch. Let's see if that does anything. Eh, it's not changing a bunch. Uh, flexion, zero. I'm a little worried, but let's see what happens. These are... Oh, wait, they're not soft body yet. No, I thought they were soft body, but they're not soft body yet. Um, look, I forgot to turn on soft body. So none of this has been doing anything. These are all just, they're just, the springs are behaving like a hinge. So, okay, now things are going to get bad. So we save it. <sighs> Made of polygons and lines. It's now a soft body. I hit frame forward. Uh, it's still not bad. Still not bad. Structure back up to 100 because that's what we were originally expecting. Hit play. Okay, these are behaving more like a soft body. Now you can see something's exploding. Yeah, something is intersecting or exploding down there. But let's ignore that for now and just see what they're doing. Okay, now you can immediately see where they're... See how they have a little bit more ability to, like, bend over each other? Now, they're definitely... There's a little bit of uh, overlappy turbulence happening. But, okay, not bad. Not bad so far. What do we need to do? We are trying... We are already doing a lot of drag and lift. I'm going to crank that up to 99.99. Maybe even beyond, honestly, because I really want to be draining energy out from those. I don't want them wafting in the wind because we're going to start getting these feedback loops that could get crazy quickly.
Yeah. Seems like the more time that goes on, the more they're going to be flailing about. Um, let's try completely getting rid of the aerodynamics. I just want to see what happens. And now you see they're whipping down a lot faster. And now you can see, yeah. I mean, the drag was going a long way because see how they're like oscillating really quickly. Um, now we got to keep in mind, it's just the wind doing this. So, and essentially this is behaving just like gravity if we had any. I'm going to slow the wind down. Give it more time. Now, you can see a couple of them are intersecting each other, and that's why they're suddenly like that pop for some of them. Some of them are like, oh, like I'm intersecting, like get out of the way as quickly as possible. Um, okay, now what I want to do is try linear damping, 99, 99. Linear and angular damping. I, I've seen these behave. These numbers can make some soft bodies behave oddly, but if it drains the energy out, then it could be okay. Not enough wind strength, back to 55. I mean, there's like that one frame that's okay, but let's see if we get the same oscillation. Yeah, it doesn't really change much. And we got, we're doing a lot of energy drain here and they're still oscillating. Um, now, usually oscillation is created by you know strong numbers here, but these are not strong numbers. In fact, I'm gonna drop the structural down to 10, which should enable these to bend or stretch a little bit if need be. Not really changing anything. Uh, shear, they can shear a little bit more. Flexion, they can definitely bend more if they want to. You can see they become quite uh, floppy now. Still, wow, they're moving so much. There's so much wiggle on them. Um, so with all that wiggle, let me double check a couple things. First of all, collision noise. Let's get rid of that. No collision noise. I just want to see if that, it'd be amazing if that had a big effect, but I don't think that, yeah, it never is. Um, the springs still have springiness. Now, this isn't about stretching them, so I wonder if... I, I've got it in my head from all the cloth uh, stuff where I'm trying to drape wrinkly cloth over things. In that scenario, damping is very bad. But you know what? Damping is not always bad, so let's see what damping does in this scenario. It should be draining a lot of energy out from all of those. Um, the waviness is still there, but it makes it more subdued for sure. Then let's see, um, make this, I'm going to make the wind. It's on YouTube too. Okay, cool. Uh, if it worked, it worked. Uh, I don't think you missed anything. All I did was, the last thing I did was create a friction and I cranked the strength up to 100 and it definitely, it, it definitely is draining energy out. I'm going to jump to 500. It's definitely draining a lot of energy out, but uh oh, something's, uh, I don't like how long that's taking to calculate. Yep. It exploded. Um, I, it's draining the energy out better, but I mean, it's stopping the oscillations, but it's not stopping the chaos here. It's just, you know, there's just a lot going on. So that's not great. Now we have, by doing the spring method, we've introduced a lot of additional variables where it's, we are now saying that this is very flexible. It's very, like I'm gonna put the shear down to one. So these can really stretch. Um, the structure is even saying they can do that. So you can see that these are going to deform and change shape a lot more. But I think that's instantly going to the point where, yeah, we can't lower too much because now there's, you know, they, they quickly cease to be shell, uh, scales. So leaving that on 10, leaving flexion on 5, draining a lot of the energy out, like, and even that, it's, it's frustrating because you can see that those are bending down. And it actually does a pretty good job of getting this curvature going. And then they start trying to fight back and then we introduce that oscillation very quickly. Uh, even though right now I feel like they did a pretty good job of filling in this tougher area. It's not perfect, but you see that's doing a better job of curving over the surface. Um, one last major variable I'd like to play with would be Changing the density, we found out that the density can have a very large effect on this. I'm going to make it 10 times as, I don't know if we want it to be lighter or heavier, but I'm going to make it 10 times as dense. Mm, not helping at all. Nope, not in a visible way. I'm going to make it one-tenth as dense from the start. Uh, less oscillating, but they seem to be fighting back a little bit like they're they're maintaining their shape more perhaps i don't know it's kind of you know half dozen to one um 
Then there's uh, another thought I had had would be, you know, these are all hovering off the surface a little bit. I don't specifically have a problem with that, but if we turn this off, we can go back to the original scale. And as a small alternative, we could say that this will be based on 0, 0.0, and I can scoot this over here. So the spring will be holding it on the corner. I'll create a second spring. And now you see it's on this corner. So now we have two springs. So both of those are holding, I say, set rest length. So those are set. So now there's two springs holding the corners on. So they shouldn't be able to twist as much. And it's, it should be, it'll be double the calculations for those springs. But I don't think they'll put some crazy territory. And they'll just, yeah, I think it'll make everything a little more stable there. But it, yeah, it's not going to stop the oscillation problem. Or this bounce. And then, yeah, I'm just going to, let's try, yeah, we got a lot of friction, so I'm going to put a lot of wind. And that's, uh, they are stretching. The extra wind, well, yeah, they're, they're going to, I mean, and not in a bad way, they're flapping in the wind. It's bad for the current thing, but if these were supposed to be leaves or grass or something like that, then this, that wouldn't be a bad thing. But yeah, they stretched a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's doing the curvature. Well, okay, a couple things. In a somewhat surprising way, I mean, this is working. It's working surprisingly well. We have not explored all of the possibilities, but the um, the earlier version, let me pull that up here. Yeah, I kind of liked when they were all purple. So we'll put the purple back on. The um, This layering up this way is pretty wonderful. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I think we can push it further. There's more that we can do, but actually getting a scale pattern and brute forcing dynamics in order to get it is pretty great. I like I like abusing the systems like this. There's a lot of possibility. If you were to, if somebody was even to send me a screenshot like this, I'd be like, wait, how did they do that? So the fact that we got here, I'm pretty happy with. What I'd love to do is try and get. I mean, this entire this entire thing with scales really should have been the type of topic we tackle in the bonus stream because I want to, I like going deeper there or here I'd rather be tackling a bunch of <sighs> uh, tackling a bunch of smaller questions that we can be a little more confident about but I do like exploring it but if you like this type of content then uh, then on Patreon I do this kind of thing every Thursday where we just go crazy on one um, so I'm trying to think of what it you know I don't the, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend a few minutes to see if we can get the a flow going on a field force. I'm going to copy that same weird shape we've been working from here. And let's see if we can get uh, a flow on the surface. So uh, I don't know if we will be able to, but let's tinker. So if we create a... What's the best way to show this? Gonna be difficult oh actually it won't be difficult well to show it forces field force and in order to show it we're gonna uh, crank that up and we're gonna make it um about a thousand tall and a thousand on x and then on z we're gonna go zero so we've got a cross section right here probably too big we can increase the resolution by cutting this to about half i said about Okay, so now we've got this trapped in that shape. So if we were to feed this something, anything, let's say a random field, then now you see we get all these nice little dots giving us a direction. So I'm going to turn off the vector length, and we should see them all be a little bit more static. So there's that. Now, instead of feeding it, a field object, let's try dragging in our surface. Now, the surface, by default, is going to be viewing the points. I'm going to instead change it to surface. Now, surface takes a long time to calculate. Um, the more complicated your model, the more that this is going to be killing your playback. It's just very important. But the nice thing is that we've got a normal here. This normal is uh, perfectly facing away from the object. The problem is, is that there's no math to tell this to rotate 90 degrees. We can add 90 degrees, but 
that's an additive process where it takes this and changes the orientation in an additive way, but not in a rotational kind of way. So instead, instead, we have not done this on stream, but I played with it a little bit. We will use a volume builder and the volume builder can be set to a vector mode now. The vector mode is going to be weird. Let's turn off our field force. The volume builder, let's feed it the subdivision surface. And now you can see that this is doing something very similar. You can see that the entire surface has a series of normals coming off of it. But unlike what we were just doing, we can give this rotational directions. So I can put in a normalize, we can do an invert, but in this case, um, we might want to do a cross add, but let's try just doing a rotate. And by creating a rotate, uh, currently it's on the X. I'm not sure which one we want this to be, but I'm going to say rotate 90 degrees. And um, you can see, okay, we've got an interesting flow around it, but it doesn't really have a direction. You can see it's very vertical in general, and it twists around and then travels down. So that's cool. Um, but let's say we had we wanted to give it a particular orientation. I'm going to try clicking on Z, and now that these are definitely aimed upward, and they're curving along and traveling there. These seem to be going forward, so that's kind of a problem. So that's a vector rotate, but you can see we actually were able to rotate those. Now, let me see if we can get this working. I don't know if we can, but I'm going to create a linear field. And what the linear field does... Let me show you if it works. I'm going to make this big enough. In the builder, let's temporarily turn that off and put in the volume. And it's only creating this little one. But you see that um, this linear field has given us a direction. It's now in the direction of the fall off. So there's currently a bounding box on there. But if we turn on the surface and I set this to match the object below, it's now covering everything. This is now perfectly aiming backwards based on only that orientation. But... Currently, we're combining by doing a normal. We could do an add, but add, add this is the way it would look if we did this inside of a field force object, but instead we're in a builder. So now we're going to try a cross product. And the cross product is spiraling around perfectly. Look, we have a spiral, which is cool. Um, but that's not actually what we want. So I wonder if we can spin... Well, if we change our linear field's orientation from, I, I don't have a great understanding of cross, of a mode cross, but if we change our orientation from X to, let's try a Y plus, and that is doing, well, it's kind of spiraling around, but in a horizontal mode. Now just, just check and say Z and Z, Z is interesting. That's traveling this way. Oh, very strange. Very strange. Man, there's a lot to play with here. See, this this worries me because even though this, this is kind of what I was aiming for, I guess I was thinking of it maybe slightly wrong because these are spiraling around, which is great. It's great to have a spiral like this, except that means that like a scale here, I know I can't tell from the orientation, but like see how these are red and these are green over here. So that means like the green is probably pushing forward and these are pushing backward. We'd really we want them all pushing backward, but along the surface. Hmm. Cross, yeah, I mean, that's what I expect is that to be a cross. Normal is just a full-on direction. You can't blend these in that same way. And I don't think changing the order changes anything. Actually, it does. It doesn't work then. Oh, wait, that this is set to, it might work. It's just to set the objects below. So here, that is doing the same effect, yeah. So changing the order doesn't fix anything. Uh, cross product, subtracting. 
So kind of we got this cross product, which does something like that. And then the alternative is doing a rotation. Invert scale curls, fun, but that's standalone. Uh, how do we get something? It's like we need the normal of the object, which we get, but we also need the direction backward. Oh, it's so specific. I mean, and you see how the, you know we can get this mesh. Well, and then this is kind of, uh, I guess we can do it just for the fun of it, but I'm going to copy this entire thing. Let's group it, Alt-G. If we copy this and go into the purple scales, paste it. Currently, we have this wind. I'm going to say, don't do any wind. Instead, we've got our new little rig. Now, I'm going to delete. Let's keep our field force, turn that on. And now, we feed the volume builder as the field force. And I think we bring it in as, I don't remember which we bring it in as a volume object. Yeah, seems to be. Um, so that, that that's how we actually convert this into something useful. Yeah, we just have a cross section right now, but you'll see if I increase our fall off, you can see that we've got there. Now we've translated the volume builder into a field force, and this is just a cross section of it. But there we go. We have a field force that is now going to be behaving like the wind. We'll crank the power up like the wind was. And then we can unhide this. Everything else is the same, except instead of the wind constantly blowing backward, we now have this which wants to twist it in all these strange directions. So I fully expect some of them to look right and then a bunch of them to go the wrong direction. So let's see at a glance. Yeah, so these are getting pushed forward, but they bump into each other quickly and they can't go anywhere. But over here, these were being pushed correctly. And actually, and you can see a little bit of the advantage. These seem to be bending in a little bit crank up the power a little bit more. Yeah, these are following the flow better. So those aren't just blowing out randomly, they're following the curvature better. So it's not universally working, but it is working a lot better over there. So you can see this entire flat side is doing a pretty excellent job. Like from the front all the way to the back, this is working quite nicely. But once it transitions back here, that's no longer the correct orientation anymore. <laughs> you guys are too much. I'm trying not to read the chat too much because I'm not going to be able to get any progress done. Um, scales. Scales. Madness. Hmm. How do we get... How do we get the surface to all aim the same way? There, I have so many weird ideas for ways of making that blow in the proper direction. I'm going to save this as another incremental. One of the weird ideas is to create the hairs, create hairs on this again, going back there, which is weird, but this is for a completely different purpose. So with that selected simulation, Add hairs. So, boom, we get hairs. Cool. Now, I only want this to be one segment long. The hairs are only one segment long. The hairs are based on the guide, as guides. So, that's literally every single one. These are currently copying onto the polygon, or it's copying onto the points, which is fine. Currently, they're really long. We don't need it that long. Drop it down to 10. Cool. Now, here's kind of here's where I'm at. Under generate, we turn off hairs and I will turn on a flat. They're going to be really skinny. So 22 by 22. There we go. So now what we've done is generated 
a series of polygons. These are all single polygons. You see there's only a single little polygon on there. So that is a way of us, that, that is a, a way of um, pulling an orientation. But you can see right now that the hairs all have very random directions and I'm honestly not sure of a way around that. So currently the alignment is free. And we could say, look why. And it's local. Let's turn off local. Look X. Hmm. Now let's see. Okay, so this is looking X. So this is actually a pretty good version of the target that we were having so much trouble with. So you can see all of these are aiming forward to whatever degree that they can, forward being X. So you can see that these are actually giving us really nice orientation in general. Um, but, uh, um, you know what, actually, I don't know, because, like, that's pretty good. If the normals are all the orientation, I hope they are. That's pretty good. It's almost exactly what I was hoping for, so I'm not sure why I'm complaining. Okay, so now, um, to keep it simple, I'm going to make that editable, and now it turns into a polygon object. I'm going to copy that, but I'm also going to undo so that stays alive. And let's save this. Uh, control... Um, say project A, yeah, control shift S, that's what I hit. Didn't, no, now it pops up. Um, USB scales hair tests. Okay, so now we have these as a way of getting, I'm kind of inclined to actually just drag this over because if we turn off dynamics and these are just what they are, if we have play, they don't get affected at all. Cool, so. I don't think we need another copy, so I'm going to let's go back into here. Paste the hair. It's going to be broken because it doesn't have an object. Now it does. Hide the scales for a, a moment. All right, now all of those are back again. We get all these polygons. Now keeping a parametric is good because I could go inside of our material and increase the thickness. And you can see I can actually make these polygons bigger. Excellent. So with those being what they are, those can give us a direction. So surface, this could be so weird. So in, I'm going to delete our that entire um, volume vector brig. I'm going to hide these splines because we need to see these a little bit better. And we can delete that spline. So many layers when we're doing this kind of exploring. All right. Now, we need a field force. Yes, my brain is starting to get fried here. We need to go and make a force, field force. And the field force is going to be fed the hair object as a point object. And this point object, oh, no, it's being, oh, wait. Um, now I can change it to be, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, I need to be able to see it better. So I'm going to change this to not display vector, crank up the line density. Okay, cool. So let's move this somewhere visually more useful. So up here, we get these weird little fuzzy sphere fall offs, which is neat, but we're going to change that to not be points, but the surface. Okay, now, now these are looking at the surface of the hair. Is that correct? It doesn't seem like what I expected. Unless it looks at the front and back, a single polygon. Mm, okay, uh, I need to test. That's too complicated to scene, so I'm gonna open up a new file, Field Force. Create a single polygon, or just a flat polygon here. Set it to one by one, so it's a single poly. Field force, make it editable. Put this into the field force display, crank it, turn off vector. Okay, so this is what we were getting in the other one. We're getting all these little points. And instead, we grabbed it and we said, you're not a point, you're a surface, and then this happens. Okay, so it does, it's not just restrict effects inside, outside inside and outside, none. 
hmm, clip the shape? No. What I was hoping is that we just get some normals shooting off of it. Oh, that's too bad. That's not useful at all. If it's giving this kind of, if it's returning this way, the entire reason to pursue that was to get that working. It doesn't. Um, I think. Think, 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 think. Um, oh man, it's so cool that we got that orient this orientation, but is it not? Is it really not going to be useful to us at all? Because it follows the curve perfectly. There's the weird extract normals. Um. We don't, I don't think we need to affect the hairs. They're already in the orientation I want them to be. And I'm not trying to make scales out of the hairs. These are just supposed to provide some geometry for me. It's supposed to provide a direction for the dynamic scales we're using. So let me think. Oh, uh, I was going to attempt to steal normal directions from this. This is weird. Um, oh man, how do you get a normal? There's a normal tag that you can only get through a very goofy process, which was like some sort of exporting as an FBX and then bringing it back in again. Everybody keeps saying target effector. I'm not sure you know what I'm trying to do here. I don't think anybody knows what I'm aiming for here. I'm not... What I'm currently trying to do, I don't think the target effector comes into play at all. What I'm trying to do is get a field force that blows everything in the proper direction. These are the proper direction, but the field force won't acknowledge them as a direction. I mean, the target, can the target pull, or what you're trying to say is that the target can pull a direction from the normals of the geometry? If that's what you're saying, then maybe the target factor could be relevant. But uh, as soon as we get in the target factor, it's so specific. Um, and we don't want to look at nodes. We want to field direction, but the field direction is just going to be fed you know, this stuff again, we can feed it the hair. And then and then we again, we go to the surface and that that doesn't give us a correct orientation. So these hairs don't give us a flow at all. Um, I wonder, this is goofy, but could we? Oh, man, we're getting weird now. But you know what? I don't care. Let's get weird. I'm going to make a, what's the lowest poly? I guess a helix will be fine. I'm going to make a helix spline, drop it down to three points. That's as small as it can be. Uh, zero radius, zero angle, zero rotation, length of 10. Um, I should have just made it a fish shape now that uh, you're saying it. I just made it this random shape, but it's, it's strangely fish-like. All right, so I've got a helix. It is there. So if I create a cloner and I clone onto an object and the object is the hair object and I clone onto the polygon center, then now, <laughs> now I have a series of tiny splines aiming in the direction that I want them to. All right. So I actually want them to be going 180 degrees from where they currently are. That's easy enough. Spin them around 180. All right, good job, tiny splines. Now let's, ex I'm gonna scale them bigger. 
There we go. Now we have a series of tiny splines all aiming the direction I want them to. So now we've, that we've got a series of tiny splines going where I want them to, I'm going to create a connect object. And the connect object is going to turn them all into a single super spline. I'm going to copy that, undo, and then kill that hierarchy. So now I've got a super spline. This super spline is going to be fed in as the only variable in the field force object. And it's going to be, I want a cross section because that's way too much information. X, Y, Z. So we get this tiny cross section going. And it's too tiny, so I'm going to scale it and scale it. And now, now, ladies and gentlemen, you can see what I was trying to do. Because you can see that the direction of these arrows is traveling along the surface in the direction of the surface. So that's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> um, now, there could have been, a, if there's an easier way, you see this cross section again where they're flowing along the surface. If you can think of a better, easier way to do that, I would love to hear it. But in any case, this is successfully traveling along that surface. That's why I've been trying to do this entire time. Um, but what's great is that this is three dimensional. So as I pull it through, you see it continues following the orientation because these splines are traveling all over the place. We get the little cowlick up in the front, but and eventually they'll be pointing at the back, but everywhere else is following the, the proper orientation. So, 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 with that in mind, we can go and crank up the power of this to 150. We can turn on our, turn on our cloner, get all the scales that is blowing it in the wind. It's the simple dynamics. So that should all be fine, honestly. Um, save as another version. Hit play. Oh, we're getting a little crazy here. What's going on? Um, sorry, I will go away. Target. That's not doing anything. Those are cloning. That's scaling. This is giving, giving color. Um, what do we got? I mean, the entire thing might be backwards. Hmm. A little bit hard to tell. So, visually looks correct. I mean, which is the orientation here? I can always just go in here and say um, direction, invert direction. So now it's the exact opposite. Let's see what that does. Oh, there we go. I think it was backwards and I was just freaking out because it was all backwards. Okay. Okay. Let's assess the damage. So, all right. I think we have our best version yet. This completely absurd rig. This isn't blowing in quite as much as I want it to. Let me look at this field force from a different point of view. We'll make it flat on Y and we'll add some width so we can get a vertical cross section. And yeah, I mean, it seems right. You can see that curves in. Maybe, well, I mean, maybe the wind isn't strong enough. Maybe, maybe we need this to tilt in more. I'm not sure. Let me give it a, let me try something. If we grab this and say, if these are all oriented in the same way, which I kind of hope they are. Yeah, okay, so you can see I can make these all pull out and they're perfect hairs. Oh, the orientation is so good. Okay, so they all rotate out, but I'm gonna say, actually, I don't wanna rotate in. So we're gonna try and, like they're forced back in their correct direction, but they also are really getting pushed into the surface a little bit. Uh, I would also love if we can make this, feed that directly into the field force. So I'm gonna see if I can override that. Wink. And let's see what our cross section is doing. It's a little bit weird. What is our cross section doing? Um, 
Well, I'm gonna make it editable. Copy, undo, turn off, paste, and drag that in just to see if there's a difference there or is it just me rotating it in? I think, no, it's just me rotating it in. So I think that this version works. Replace, is it not gonna replace? Weird, undo, undo. It worked before. All right, I'm just gonna do until Yeah, that's the connect. These are in there. So I don't know if this will work, but let's try. All right, that's the only wind going. They are blowing backward. Maybe crank up the strength a little bit more. But, okay, well, I think the theory, it's they're getting a little bit of weirdness here, so maybe we're tilting in too much. But you can see that these are definitely pointed in more. But let's just uh, let's, let's investigate. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I feel like the curve is being followed better, but then at the same time, I feel like they're not pinching in quite as much. I'd kind of think it'd be the opposite. I think they'd be pinching in better. Uh, I'm going to crank up the strength more so it's even stronger. Really getting forced back into their position. I guess, me, oh, I mean, hmm, I don't know. Because you, here's, here's the current thought. Maybe, I mean... That's still pretty good, but the current thought is, oh, and then I wasn't even talking about it, but look, here's the advantage of what we're doing. If I, if I spin over to this other side, these are good too. That's what we've been trying to do this whole time, um, is trying to get the orientation working everywhere and it's doing a pretty good job of it. Um, so with all these oriented correctly, you can see that it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's not perfect everywhere, but I think that's mostly distribution of uh, scales. But you can see wherever the scales are, they are getting the correct orientation. They are blowing the correct direction. And I think a lot of this has to do with scale and the count of them. So there's definitely work to be done there. The method we did was quick and relatively easy. I guess it was easy and pretty quick. It wasn't super quick, but it was pretty quick. Um, Okay, so these are all blowing in the proper direction. Cranking up the power actually went a long way, but I, the other thing I was going to do is grab this cloner and not rotate quite as much. So we rotated 45 degrees. I'm going to try doing 22 degrees. That should automatically refresh everything. Uh, and here's here's what's worrying me a little bit is this uh, the cross section. I guess no. If I look on the top, well, it's just it's a little weird. As I moving this field force doesn't do anything. So as you see, as I move. As I move just the field force, it should be refreshing as it passes through. And you can see that the, uh, like, why do we get this little, we get some of these floaters out in weird positions. But I think just the series of splines might be combining in some interesting ways. Um, just something to keep in mind. But okay, now we oriented it not quite as much. There's still some rotation, but not all of it. Give it time to settle. These dynamics, first of all, are running incredibly fast. Very happy with that. Um, so this is a kind of splitting the difference and these still bent in pretty well. I wonder if there's even something to be said for doing like a two stage one or, um, yeah, that's not a bad idea. So here, here, here's, here's a thought right now. If we... If I make this field force be fed, we don't need this anymore because we got a clean setup. If we tell this to do the just point in the proper direction, so this is the very clean version. And you see here, it doesn't freak out. It actually can generate these almost everywhere. So if I do this, it's not going to get in the crevices very well, but it's going to push everything generally in the correct direction. All right. So that's kind of like, that's one field force. And then if that field force did its thing, then we can, I'm just gonna make a second field force. We can totally do that. And we'll feed into that one, the subdivision surface and turn that onto surface. Now we gotta be careful. Cause like I said, these calculate very slowly, but we turn on surface and we start giving a radius and you can now see there's a cross section. So once again, let's do a different cross section, zero, 500. There we go. Now you can see that we've got these and they're all pointing outward, I think pushing away. So we just go to the object and we go to direction and invert that direction. So now we've got one field force that was 
pulling them in the general direction. And now I've got a second field force. And now I'm just going to turn one off and turn the other on. And this should, now they're already in that spot. And now I'm saying, now just push into the surface as hard as you can. Whoa. Uh, maybe, maybe they weren't backwards or maybe it's correct. I'm not sure. Um, let's uninvert. Maybe they was, I'm not sure. I, I don't know the intuitive color. So maybe we did want them pushing. If I play, I just want to see if it feels better. Um, weird, but well, no, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't tell if it's working or not. I'm just going to turn both of them on. So like one is pushing backward and the other is pushing flat down. And let's see kind of what we get. And then I'm going to invert the direction and see if it looks better or worse. And this was just a theory. Maybe it's, maybe it's not as good. It, what's strange is I feel like this, like this one looks like it's doing a great job here and it's doing all right over there, but then it's a complete mess over here. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, there's a, there's a test. It, I'm not super happy with the way it went. So we're going to go back to rotating our angle of this. I'm going to say 30 degrees. Let's just let that do its thing. So it's a little more tilted back than before. Let's take a second for some of these to catch up, which is interesting. But once they do, once they do, it's very nice. Yeah. Oh, man, this is nice stuff. Um, all right, let's see. How What can we do to push this a little bit further? Because we're already over time, um, and I've got a meetup to go to tonight. But let's save this as another version. <sighs> No, I'm very acutely aware of the time. I'm just having fun, so we're still going. Um, okay, so just as a way of trying to improve this a little bit, I'm going to create smaller scales. And... Yeah, we're going to create smaller scale. I'm just going to... Well, let's start out by just creating smaller scales because it seems like overall they were bigger than they needed to be. So let's hit play and see what we get. goes quite quickly. Yeah, the smaller scales are going to fold in on each other a lot better. So you can see they're uh, filling up that space. And I mean, essentially, there's a minimal amount of scales that we could, in theory, need. And then, you know, the main thing being is as we design the individual scale, and if I, I should be able to interactively scale this down. Yeah, if we, you know, there's a certain point where, just based on the mesh that we're running along, it's going to fill in the space. And I mean, I don't think we want any more than that. Um, and then some of the idea would go to making more scale. I mean, I guess that's one thing to consider. And based on that, I wonder if we don't need all that scaling up on the top, which I think is this one. Although it doesn't, maybe I already had it off because it's not doing anything that I can see. Um, but then we could double the number of scales. Like we need twice as many lines and twice as many scales. Of course, that will take twice as long to dynamically calculate. So, but shrinking, you know, is going to increase that resolution. Um, but depending on the, oh, and let's also visually hide this hair, which, you know, it's been super useful. It did do something for us. But yeah, these scales are pretty good. Well, of course, once we rotate to an, in, uh, an angle, it's too far. But you just see that we didn't have a loop here. There was no cut there, so it didn't know what to do with it. So there was no subdivision there. Um, interesting. And then, you know, so there's that, and then we can scale up the scales. And then that's going to eat up more space, which means we need less of them, but they're more likely to start fighting each other. But if they overlap more, then we're less likely to see like the stuff underneath. If you, I rotate back here, it's a lot harder to see what would be like the skin of the fish or whatever this is. Um, but our orientation here is wonderful. The um, We might be able to generate um, exactly the number. It, it, the hairs were doing a really good job of getting an orientation. And I wonder if we can use that as a method of getting the orientation. Um, so actually, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. We had the hair test set up here. So this is working really well. And you see the orientation on these, as far as I can tell, was perfect. So 
if we continue that method, we just need more of them. So if we take everything and subdivide, uh, we will do a subdivision surface subdivide. So now there's more of them. Now here's a trick with hair. It's trying to create an exact number and before it was manually fed in the number. So there's a count. Now we just made it be a lot more. So I'm just got a whole bunch more. And then as soon as I click, it's going to drop back down to whatever is the maximum number. And then it's properly working. So there we go. Now we've got, a, now we've got four times as many hairs, but that's also just four times as many scales. So then if we treat these as the basis for places to clone the scale, that could be good, but Right now, I guess, I mean, they don't have to be on the surface and then we could just offset. So yeah, these will, these should work fine. All right, well, let's find out. I'm gonna make that. We could bring this over parametrically, but I'm once again, just gonna make it editable, copy, undo. And back into whichever version we're working in. It's gonna getting a little messy here, but I'm gonna, let's clean up a little. We don't need that. We don't need that one. Oh, one of those we seem to have needed. Oh yeah, those are the, but we're going to kill that off anyway. So we don't need that. We don't need that. Plane effector, what is that doing? Oh, that's giving us some rotation. We'll build that from scratch. We don't need that. Random color, that's the old hair. Don't need that. This is the surface. That wasn't working. Delete that. And paste in the new hair. All right, so these are the new hairs. Uh, so we're going to clone new hairs. Here's how we're going to do it. I am going to clone onto an object. The object is going to be the new hair object. Um, it's going to take a second to think about. I don't want to clone onto the vertex. That's four times as many as needed. I want polygon center. So we've got one of these on the center of every polygon. Excellent. There's currently some crazy rotations. We'll zero those out and figure out what our actual orientation we want. Right now, it seems like we are backwards. That's fine. Easy enough. 180, not uh, 180. Uh, the scales are so subtle, it's a little hard to tell. It's also a little big, so I'm just going to scale them down. And you know what, right now, I think we can set this to multi-instance. This should be incredibly fast then. All right, so this is just for me orienting. Okay, yeah, we now have the correct rotation, uh, both at the start out. And then I can grab transform, and let's see if we can... No, do you see we can't? Oh, okay, if I do twist the 180 a little bit, we can get our alternating scales. So that's working fine. And then these are hovering off the surface a little bit, but you know what? I was gonna say that we need to just do a little offset here, which we could super easily do on Y and I could shrink, I could push them back on the surface, but you know what? Them hovering off the surface a little bit could go a really long way to making it so that they can fold down more because they, they're trying to collide with the surface. So given that extra room, they might be able to lie down flat a lot better. So we've got a lot of density in certain areas, like, oh man, it gets so dense here. And that's just because there's more polygons there. We really want a very even density overall. Um, yeah, I think we want a very, very even density, but that's okay for now. So these are all dynamic. Let's turn off. There's a lot more of them, so it will take longer, but we'll go back to instance mode. And this field force is still taking on, oh, I deleted the old hair, but you know what, that's fine. We'll just clone onto, I mean, it was working nicely. I did, I went kind of on a rampage and deleted it all, but I think we can take that hair and clone onto it. So cloner, clone onto that hair. There'll be more of them. but hopefully that's not insane. Save another increment and frame forward. You'll see me, oh, okay, what's happening here? Um, connect, it is connecting to a secondary object. I'm just gonna say clear. I don't want it to connect to a secondary object. It's just gonna be whatever it is. Um, but they were kind of exploding and flying away. Why would that happen? They do have a connector. Connector is connecting to them. They shouldn't fly away. One frame forward. Okay, they didn't fly away. I'm not sure what was up. But now, yeah, now they're doing their thing. 
Um, the field force is still on the connect. That should still be giving the proper orientation. And you see what I was going to say is I'm frame. I, I hit like frame forward, frame forward. And the reason I do that is to make sure that the dynamics will refresh properly before I hit play. And I mean, the refresh is going to be pretty slow right now, but it's not going to be terrible. So, I mean, it's going to be, it's not going to be real time, but it's not going to crash us. We're not going to freeze. Um, There doesn't really seem to be much force happening right now. There's plenty of force in here, and we've got that connect. I'm wondering if we... Uh, I like the mesh that we got here. Easy enough to get again. I'm going to undo, get back to this, copy that one. And that's when we had fewer of those hairs to get the direction. Copy, undo, back into the new one, paste. This will be direction, and that is what our cloner is referencing. So there should be a lot less of those. Now this connector, okay, I mean, before the connector was on the surface, which makes it ignore it, which honestly, I guess maybe that's a, that's fine. I would think turning alpha would be fine. Although everything, well, it's working better now. It's moving. It wasn't moving a second ago. Um, I'm going to undo and let's clear this out. I want to see if it can still run. Because now I do want it to be able to collide with that surface if it wants to. Still working fine. It looks like uh, it was just the hairs. Too many hairs were being cloned on every single one of them. It didn't know what to do with that. Um, so let's see what we get. All right, it's settling in. Now, we've got a couple that didn't... Okay, let's see. Overall, really good. Um, now, the, here's the interesting thing, is this technique is now showing that our mesh density... Um, um, sorry, I'm crossing thoughts, but I just looked... Um, Spatten, you're saying to bevel. Are you saying the bevel, like the fish's points, so that there's more in between points, so we get less of a grid pattern? I'm just curious what you're referencing. Unless you're talking to someone else. Um, if we were on a cylinder or something simple, this would be a lot easier. I'm trying to do the hard mode because nobody's just putting scales on a cylinder. You're putting scales on a mesh. Um, now, having said everything, well, okay, so this is still not perfect, but you can now see that we're getting wonderful curvature up here on the top. We're getting, there's a lot more scales here because our mesh density is a lot heavier here, but regardless of that, they are still very nicely overlapping each other. Um, over here, it's getting a little busy, um, but it was already busy before we hit play, so once again, mesh density there. It's just such a dense mesh that it it can't go anywhere. There's too many too many copies in the same place. Um, where the, the mesh density is a lot more even, I think we're getting a lot cleaner of a result. They're alternating wonderfully. They're overlapping. Um, and it's working on the entire mesh. So at this point, I feel like we've got a really really solid technique and the only thing well first of all we like we've got some interesting pole issues here but i think you'll observe hang on i got an alarm going um you will see that uh, look at the orientation here like it's already seems like it's a little bit confused you see how like the angles are kind of shifting and changing around so I would attribute to some of, like, it gets a little confused based on these subdivisions. Um, so there could just be, like, some mesh flow issues there where, like, I, I might even, it, it could even get to the point where it's like, this this automatically happened, we get this automatic orientation. But potentially, and keep in mind that we don't, we've been making it editable. I don't think we have to make it editable. Um, as long as it's not dynamic, which I think I already turned off. Yeah, it's already not dynamic. Keep in mind, in an up. Uh, I think in a really cool way is potentially we could use our hair tools and 
brush. What's the difference between brush and comb? I don't know. And then there's even a rotate? Yeah, I don't know. A lot of these I don't know. But, you know, we, we're still free to grab these and be, okay, let's get the flow working a little bit better there. I want them oriented that way. And over here where it gets maybe a little bit confused, like get a little bit more orientation like that. So this might fix those issues where it's like, okay, it doesn't know what to do in this type of situation. And especially here, like what direction is that supposed to flow? We don't have any information for it. So um, maybe it was bad to center these on the points. Maybe what you actually wanted these on the center of polygon or a, yeah, polygon center and say polygon center and then update guides or is it uh, editing regrow there. So, okay, by doing that, now we're in the center of a polygon. And instead of having one right here in the center where it didn't know where to go, now there's four of them that instantly know which way to go. So that might instant instantly create a better a better layout for it. Um, now, and once again, next problem, density, mesh density. Here you can see that there's a lot of space in between, but just look at how many scales were being created here. And this, this is actually, this is not a subdivided one. You can see there's so many. So the mesh density is having the biggest problem. So a very clean mesh would be the solution to these, these ones that are pinching up. So I think painting the ones we just did, a little bit of cleanup, changing to polygon center would have cleaned up this front. We'll tinker, you know, tinker with that. I mean, I guarantee you, I, I had different plans, but I guarantee to tomorrow in the bonus stream, we're going to be playing with this more, trying to really nail the technique down and maybe get a real tutorial out of it. Um, you know, and tomorrow will just be more exploration of this technique. Although I feel like we have figured out a lot of the meat of it right here. Um, now, if we were to just bring this, because the, this is going to cover up the mesh, I feel like we, you know, you want the fishy pattern where it's like alternating every other one, even though this isn't actually alternating. It's just all in the same line. What was the, um, what was the bevel? Did you ever spend uh, select all points in bevel with limit turned on? Oh yeah. So, okay. You, you were saying what I thought. So it was in regards to this. So yeah, it's kind of using the technique I was talking about last week. Um, that's Spatton is talking about here, but I do think it's a neat idea. So I'll mention it. So if we just take our mesh and we go over here, you see, we've got this, you know, this overall poly count, this isn't going to help with the evening out, ev evening, even, even, ing out of the mesh. Um, because, uh, or, but what he's suggesting is, uh, the bevel trick I like talking about, which is if we had MS, we'd go to the bevel tool and now we can click and start dragging. And cause we're on, on point mode, you can see it's beveling the points and you see that those will split up. And if we turn on limit, as I drag it, then it'll do this. And we can get this really interesting pattern like this, which might then create uh, the overlapping, um, a better overlapping geometry on everything. So now we've done that, we can select all and optimize. I think UO is a shortcut and now she cleans up that mesh. And now we've got a completely inverted mesh flow, but it might create better alternating uh, tiling for the mesh. So, I mean, you know, why not? Let's see what this does. We're already well over. Let's keep going. So we'll paste this in as our mesh and we'll tell the hair that should be referencing that instead. We'll crank up the number just in case it's a higher poly count, regrow, hide the old mesh. And yeah, I think that we do need more, more. Why is it not? Uh... Mm, this is, um, how do I get around this? Reroot, regrow. It's not letting me pull this number up, but it's not, there's not enough of them yet. Regrow. Um, I don't want to lose any information here, but what did we do to get the orientations and everything we did? Because this flow is still really good. Um, we generated a flat look on X. Okay, yeah, look on X, simple enough. Um, okay, so. I'm going to turn off that hair and make it from scratch. So simulate object, add hair. It's really long. We'll set that back down to 10 and set it to polygon center. Regrow. Interesting. Um, okay. I, I, I know your suggestion was for, I wonder if inverting that should make the difference though. Maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's very strange. Uh, I'm clicking on polygon center and I'm trying to put a hair in the center of every single polygon, but you see that it's not. 
and it's still locking me to this count. And I'm not, I'm not sure why to tell you the truth. Um, U shift O pop open optimize. So here's the overall optimizing. I make a much bigger optimize. What is our current polygon count? There, it says there's 1,300 polygons, but these hairs, these hairs are only acknowledging every other one. Let's do it again. So I've got this. I've got every polygon selected. Simulation. Add hair. Not on the polygon vertex, but instead the polygon center. Oh, interesting. Maybe I maybe I, I just did that bigger optimize. Now it is putting them on all of them. So, um, so I I think I don't need that one anymore because I can go back to this one. And now that we've re-optimized, I think if I crank this number up. Oh, unless it doesn't. Update guides, regrow. Or did I put the wrong surface in there? I'm going to feel really dumb if I just didn't drag the new object in. No, it doesn't seem to. Uh, well, well, weird. Okay, well, I've optimized and it's not liking it, so we're learning about another weird little quirk. Once again, polygon center. I think there was a few extra, so I'm going to crank that up. Yep, now we've got the extra ones. Regrow, just to be sure. Set the new length, 100. Go to generate oh, hairs, generate as guides. Dynamics, no. Generate, don't render hairs. Create a flat polygon. Transfer that same material over because that should just automatically work. The subdivisions on the guides should be one. The subdivisions on the hairs are as guides. Excellent. Um, this old one we don't need. And now we change the generate alignment to look X, I believe. Yep, so we get that nice flow. Uh, we still got this one here that, yeah, I feel like this might confuse it here. It doesn't know what the correct orientation is, but well, just for fun, let's uh, grab our brush. I'm going to middle mouse button click just to scale it down a little bit. We'll tilt that one in the distinct orientation, click to scale it back up again. Actually, I think this is a little bit better than before, but I'll just tilt a little bit. This flow seems all right, but I'll just tilt a little bit. Tilt it a little bit. I'm not feeling tilted. Um, these are crossing each other a little bit, but... I'm not even sure what orientation. I'll just let those do what they want to do. Yeah, these pinches get a little bit weird. Um, but anyway, this should be... Oh, but no, is this more subdivided? I think it does... might double the poly count. So this is supposed to be our orientation mesh, but we know that it didn't like the doubled up mesh. But anyway, that created a new flow. So that would give us a new direction too. And then we need the new mesh in which to clone... Actually, I guess we could use the direction from the previous one because, you know, the direction didn't change. Um, but what we do want is this nice new mesh. Let's grab the optimized one from the hair test. Back here. Paste. Clone. Object hair. Bloop. So now um, that's this one is not... Um, subdivided as much the last one was subdivided double the amount so why don't we do that uh u shift s smooth subdivision turn on boom double poly count uh, this one can still be the collider body that's fine i don't need the subdivisions on this high poly version we'll hide this um uh scale clone surface and then direction two i don't think we need that one i'll hide it we'll just keep direction one hair i think that's the old mesh so we're going to keep the old orientation we're cloning new polygons rewind all the way it's going to look a little weird in the beginning Ooh, it's going to look really weird look at that That's a strange pattern. Let's uh, zero out the orientation and figure out. Yeah, it seems to have changed the angle that those all want to rotate. So let's try negative 90. What are we cl I'm cloning onto a polygon, but why does it seem to alternate every other one? That does us no good. 
can't rotate 90 degrees when they're all 90 degrees from each other. So I'm going to try changing it from polygon center to vertex. Oh, madness. How did we... Oh, I was cloning onto the hairs before, not the surface. So I do need the, oh, direction two. That's our new one, right? I don't remember, so I'm just gonna go back here, make the hair editable, call it direction two, copy, undo. Okay, sorry. Sorry, that makes sense. I was like, why, why, why do we lose the orientation? But we get the orientation via the direction. So delete direction, paste it, direction two. That's what we're supposed to be cloning on to. Thank you very much. Polygon center. Uh, and we lost our orientation, but I think it was 194. Yeah, so they start alternating. That's the higher. Oh, yeah, but this is... Uh, if we're going to subdivide... To create the hairs, that have to be in the other one. So this is this is not as many hairs. That's fine. I'm going to continue. T for scale. Scale these up a little bit, just because I think they're going to be a little bit smaller overall. The direction has still got the same field forces, but now they're alternating in a more interesting way. We still have the same orientation. I feel confident in hitting play. That's interesting. Every other one didn't seem to want to move. Oh, that is interesting. Um, I wonder if our direction has like some sort of fall off Thing that's happening yeah definitely do you see how um when i play do you see how that every other one was moving and these are not and that that's probably got to do with the direction that we were cloning onto earlier so maybe we will change this to look at direction two to create the splines and so that was one centered on every single one and we'll let that go Oh, good. Now almost none of them move. It's a long curve. Um, look at full power. That might that actually... It's going to be funny if that works. Oh, I can't believe I was forgetting that. Oh. I forgot that splines have an offset, that they're offset where they fall off as they go. So even earlier where it seemed like they weren't going everywhere, do you see how like it's really inconsistent here? And as I crank it up, as soon as we go beyond the point, it's like, oh, now it turns on and they all suddenly are here at full power, which is good. That I mean, that just makes everything better. So now we don't need this to be nearly as strong. I can drop that way down back to 55 and then hit play. And now every single one of them is being affected perfectly. And oh, they're pulling the direction perfectly. Oh my God, look at that, it's so good. Okay, so they're a little small because we didn't have twice as many. So I'll scale them up a little bit more. And now we'll let them go. It should be nice and quick. Boom, oh, look at these, look how smooth that is. That's amazing. Um, yeah, look at that. Um, our mesh density is our big problem now. We've got the direction, we've got the flow, we've got the offsetting scales. By the way, thank you, Spatten, for that suggestion. I mean, what I, I was actually earlier going to be like, why don't I put a null in and alternate every other scale so we get every other one? But by inverting the mesh like that, we're instantly getting the offset scales. Um, so the tricky part here would just be getting really good mesh flow. And then if you have good mesh flow, you're going to be able to get the scales. Um, The, um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think of where to push this for. I mean, there's more to explore. I want to simplify the process, explore it more tomorrow. But, um, as far as like what we've kind of covered today, I'm trying to think if there's anything I want to push further. I mean, I kind of would like to have twice as many of these just to make them look nice. I'm going to try scaling them up and then, yeah, we'll, we, we will make a second. We'll subdivide it more just so we can see the increased resolution because this is now working so nicely. But let these all, let the wind blow them down. Field forces for the wind. Um, now they're overlapping pretty well. The smaller scale, the more that these gaps can be filled in. And also keep in mind, if we took this purple material and threw it on the mesh, it's going to be really hard to tell that we're seeing through to the mesh. Yeah, you see, it just instantly disappears. So like those little gaps, not something I'm worried about. Um, 
but getting these scales all perfectly overlapping. Very nice, very, very nice. Um, mesh density, just a little too heavy in certain spots, but I'm fine with that. Um, just because we're still working with this weird mesh, I'm going to go back over here. We will create twice as many hairs by subdividing this thing. U, Shift, S, smooth subdivision, yes. Twice as many, back to the hairs. Guides at a zero or two. That's going to crank it up. Now we get more, regrow them. There we go, perfectly following the flow. Is there any place it will be confused? Even here, that looks pretty good. Maybe the couple front scales will be a little bit confused. But, you know, if you have to fix a few scales, then... You know, that's on you. Can I, the technique, if it's not 100 million percent perfect, I'm not going to, I'm not going to flip out on that. Um, so very even distribution here. Um, make that editable. Copy, undo. Back into here. Paste. Uh, this becomes the clone surface. Goodbye. Rewind. Oh, it's on direction two. That's fine. Put this here. And now, boom, twice as many. Uh, I'm sorry, four times as many, uh, which means these are way too big. Visually hide that. We don't need direct. Are we using direction one anymore? No, we're on direction two. So direction one is dead. Ah, oh, look at that. Look how they perfectly flow. It's so good. Okay, 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 okay. Um, okay, I want to see how big the scales are. So... Just to have more real time, I'm going to set that to multi instance. Grab our scale. Way too big. Shrink. 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 Okay, there we go. Yeah, a little bigger. Okay, so we get that. I mean, they already look pretty good there. Like, I feel like because we're getting such no nice orientation here, even if you didn't want to do the, the, the dynamic method, which is working incredibly well, I still feel like you could probably just, uh, if I tilt that, yeah, look at that. Without even doing the dynamics, I can tilt it 90 degrees, and we almost already get the pattern. Um, but them dynamically intersecting, you know, them stopping each other from dynamically intersecting. But essentially, the hair is doing all the work. I mean, I gotta actually, I gotta tell you, in, in some ways, this is already better. Like, like this is going so smoothly. This is without running dynamics at all, and it's just taking on the orientation. Then we've taken the rotation, and now we get all of these overlapping, and they'll just pass through. So. That just works awesome. In fact, I think that this would automatically deform with the mesh. Um, if Let's just find out. If I were to grab this and let's just uh, save incremental uh, and grab and what tool I don't do. What, what do I want? The, the magnet tool, mesh, move, magnet. If I just take that. Pull. Oh, wait, it's not on that one. Well, if this was deforming, I'm going to deform that. If I were to pull. <sighs> I'm, I mean, I'm cloning onto it, so I might not like it too much. But Oh, these are individual little pockets, so that's dangerous. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't want to go to that rabbit down this rabbit hole, but it's really, really neat. You can see how we can get these beautiful scales even without the dynamics, but I like the dynamics part. So anyway, we're still multi-instancing, so I want to get the scale right, but kind of rotating them to, went a long way to getting them right. And if we just scale enough so that they're all overlapping very nicely, I we might even be able to get them in their orientation a little bit better if we just do a little bit of this rotation not all the way. Let's see how far. Too far, go easy. Yeah, if we did something like that, a bunch are intersecting, so they could freak out, but they're already tilted a little bit more in their orientation, so maybe less variation in the way that they um, they bend. And even there, I mean, right now we still we're using the ragdoll connection, but let's go ahead and set this to instance. Save again. We didn't change anything, and just hit play. It's going to be a few frames, but these are all bending. Uh, yeah, you can definitely see there's some calculation time. But hey, if you're just doing this to generate the mesh, these are all bending. What's great here is they're not going to intersect. That's the point of this. If you do the purely cloner-based way, they're going to intersect. If you do it this way, they're going to be like, oh, wait, I, I, there's too many here. They're not going to intersect. So even just, uh, I just let go a few frames, not very much. Uh, they calculate for eight frames here. And now, uh, now you can see that we get 
you know, these will bunch up nicely where before they'll just pass through each other and now they won't. So making them dynamic, I don't feel like there's that much of an ad additional cost. And now we have them properly overlaid. Um, holy cow. This is pretty cool. Okay, and now uh, the last thing I was going to say, like, and I know I've said that a couple times, but currently the connector is set to ball and socket. But if we were to change that back to the hinge, it can only rotate in one orientation, but they're still dynamic. So now they're less likely to get out of alignment. So if we just let that run a few frames, they'll all bend backward in the orientation of the wind. And they won't twist. So I think the pattern will look a little bit uh, more uniform. Uh, I guess it's a trade-off where the pattern will look more uniform. But they'll do less of a good job of filling in the gaps. Um, very quickly, it gets to like its final position there, all based on all the collisions. And now, yeah, and now I, I just like, look how clean this pattern is. You can like, it's just catching the highlights in such a smooth flow. It's, uh, it's quite, it's quite nice. All right, Jess, it was a crazy question, but we kept up with it and we figured it out. And I got to tell you, I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe, but as far as I know, nobody's gotten scales working this well in Cinema 4D. So I definitely feel a tutorial coming on for here because I've been asked the scale question every year since the beginning. Oh, look at the way they pinch in here. Look at that. So good. Uh, keep getting phone calls. Um, I've been asked a scale question for years and there's never been an answer. Like literally never, ever been an answer. So we just went down so many paths until it was like, wait a minute, this might be good. Uh, and look at what we got. If we just, and I mean, this is a completely arbitrary mesh. And the only thing we found out about making an arbitrary mesh here is, I mean, I don't want to get, let's, let's be calm because keep in mind that I just said like, yes, I want everything to face on X and it figured itself out from there. Now, it just means that all these scales want to point in general in a particular direction. And if this was supposed to be like flowing up a tree and traveling different angles and whatnot, we might have to build that differently. But I do think proper combinations of the, of perhaps the target effector and more field forces and orientations. I think it, they could be figured out, but now just the idea of essentially the limitation right now is you want to have a nice mesh flow and you want to have a very even distribution of your polygons. We are pretty good in a lot of areas and then you can see where it pinches that it gets pinched up. I mean, and it doesn't even look bad. Like these scales just kind of uh, stick up a little bit more, but they're still being scales. Oh man, the way they're catching highlights, this would render so nicely. All right, I think it, we we plow. It, I was ready to give up on this so many times, and then it suddenly started working. Oh, look at that! We finally did it. We did it. We did it, everybody. Uh, thanks everyone who's in the chat. Who was you know? First of all, Jess, thanks for the question. Uh, so we tackle it again. That was, that's what that's like. What the theme of this year has been. We're getting very similar questions to what we've gotten in the past. And we're trying again with new ideas and some of the new tools in cinema, and it's been opening up new opportunities. And thanks for everybody who had additional suggestions on top of it. Like Spatten, thanks for the uh, reminding me of the bevel so we could actually make them alternate. The method I was going to do, I think would have been a little clunkier than that. So that's good in addition. Um, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's live stream. Uh, so if you jump on to Patreon, the Rocket Lasso Patreon, um, if you're supporting on there, then you get access to the bonus stream and we'll be playing with this more and the idea is i play with that a bunch and then i would record a tutorial um so of course the final tutorials for everybody the exploration is you know a bonus thing it's just a good excuse for me to sit down for two hours and focus on this type of project um in any case that should wrap this up we already went a full hour over and i feel like tons of people are hanging out so hopefully hopefully that was um exciting enough for everybody to stick around so that was cool um, in any case, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, uh, anybody in Chicago, I'll see you at the meetup tonight. 
uh, which I'm looking forward to. And otherwise, uh, keep, an eye, uh, keep an ear out for the announcement for Half Res, which will be in September, as it always is. But the specifics will be coming out very soon. And um, yeah, keep an eye out for the card, the cloth tutorial, and now hopefully a scale tutorial. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we'll be playing some more. Um, yeah, I'm just super pumped. That was cool. Uh, thanks again for a fun show, uh, an extra long one, and I'll see you all next week. Don't forget to jump on the Slack channel. Uh, Paul put the link in there, Rocket Lasso Slack. Um, there are cool sketch challenges every week. I think the sketch challenge this week is for candy, and then there's uh, there's different 3D challenges and chain, proje uh, chain projects, and it just layers up, and everything's really fun. Um, also, a big shout-out to Great Wanderer Studios, who has been heavily supporting me on Patreon. I super duper appreciate it. So if you see this, thank you again. Uh, I'm going to run the credits and uh, I'll see you all next time. Bye bye. Thanks so much, everybody.